Thank you. boys and girls. We are not done. So we have two more teams we need to recognize. And we're going to start off with the uh, championship of the PAL uh, Peewee teams, the cheerleading and our football team. I hear you guys won a big championship uh, last yeah. month, huh? Yeah. Exciting. Pretty cool. You know, we have a former PAL football player right here in the room, and uh, he's also the mayor of the township, <laughs> Mayor Parisi, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, and our business administrator, Mr. Sayers, was also a PAL kid. He's older than me. Now, <laughs> <laughs> but with your coaches and all, we know I did not uh, play for the PAL, but my children all were p participants of the program. I don't know if you remember, uh, Coach Tony, so he's uh, he helps about now. He kind of is in retirement, but for many years we know how hard uh, the council recognizes tonight. How hard you work, you know. This starts on August 1st, and that's a lot of days for your parents. A lot of long summer days, long summer nights, and uh, you know, many years, you know, um, you give up your vacation time. Uh, to get to practice in the summer, not an easy task to do, especially when you go to the beach, but you know you have to be there because you're committed athletes, and that is just great recognition. And all your hard work from the summer on into the fall when you have to start your homework and go to practices after school has all paid off with this great championship that you won. So first I'm gonna ask for your ch uh, cheerleading coach to come up, Ms. Cheryl Merklinger, <laughs> to say a few words. So this was my first bout with cheerleading. Um, I grew up in PAL, but from the sidelines, my brothers played, um, my father coached, my uncle played. So this was a new experience, um, but the girls did a great job. They were there every day for practice, starting August 1st with the guys for football. Um, rain, cold weather, they were out there on the track cheering for the football players. So great job by everyone. I'm really proud of all of you. Um, so with that, <laughs> Sure. Okay, before we call you up, ladies, I am going to read your citation from the council. The West Orange Township Council is proud to recognize the West Orange PAL Pee Wee Cheerleading Team. And all your names are on uh, the citation, along with your coaches, Cheryl Merklinger, Karen Kukwashi, and uh, Alyssa uh, Bope. Throughout the football season, the West Orange PAL Cheerleading Team Pee Wee Cheerleading Team supported the PAL Pee Wee Pee Wee football players from the sidelines, supporting their efforts and cheering them on to an undefeated record of 11 wins and zero losses. Nice job, ladies. The West Orange Township Council, Council is proud to recognize and congratulate the cheerleading team on their dedication and wishes them continued success in the future. All right, ladies, I'm going to have your coach call you up individually if you could come back like the baseball team did for your picture. Uh, Jessica Germonti. <laughs> Marie Costa Sparks, <laughs> Rebecca Hempy, Congratulations. Caitlin McColl, <laughs> Emma Pearson, <laughs> Maggie Rinsler, <laughs> Bailey Sampson, <laughs> Melina Sanchez. <laughs> Lily Targonski and Armani Turner. Congratulations. 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 
but not least, undefeated. It's going to be a good banquet this week. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to co uh, call up Coach Joe DePasquale. And before we get to the kids, uh, real quick, could you just, which board members are here? I just want to recognize the PAL board. Oh, uh, my brother Lou's here. Let's see who else is here. Tim, you know, Tim, Cheryl's here. Timmy coaches too. Joe. Phil's here. Phil Petuzzi. Rob House. Uh, Very good. Tom. Coach Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to get him on the board yet? What's wrong with you guys? Come on. <laughs> uh, oh, coaches Lou and Tom. Come on up. Come on down. <laughs> I just wanted I just wanted to recognize well guys. Oop. You guys ready? I just wanted to recognize the the not only the coaches but our board members that are here this evening as well. Uh, as you know, you see them in the snack bar all the time. They're working tirelessly. They are putting more hours than any any people I know here in the township. So they're really dedicated volunteers. And most of them have been doing this for a good at least 30 years now. So thank you to all the board and the PAL for keeping up the program. We're ce celebrating what you're celebrating over 50 years now, right? Close to 60? Yeah, so uh, 55. 55 years. So something they must be doing something right. Okay, so you're so this undefeated team that we have in front of us, your citation reads, the West Orange Township Council is proud to recognize the West Orange Pal Pee Wee, oh, Cheryl, you took the wrong, wrong one, Cheryl. Oh, we just have to swap this out for a sec. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we have the two cheerleader ones. That's okay. That's okay, guys. I have it. Uh, it's proud to recognize the West Orange PAL. What? Uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we we're gonna owe you new certificates. We got to get you a new certificate. That's okay, guys. The guy, the their names are on it. Pee Wee football team. Um, so we'll collect your. We'll reissue new ones out to you for the for the um, banquet, uh, Friday night is your banquet, correct? Okay. So the ones on Friday will say the West Orange Township Council is proud to recognize the West Orange PAL football team. The West Orange PAL football team completed a perfect season with 11-0 undefeated record. On November 18, 2017, they won the Hudson County Youth Football Lightweight Championship over Passaic. Nice job, guys. <laughs> The West Orange Township Council is proud to recognize and congratulate the team on their excellent sportsmanship and wishes them continued success in the future. Before we call you up, I'd just like Coach DePasquale to say a few words about you. Thank you, Michelle. You know, it's uh, pretty special when you get a group of guys 
come August 1st and you're practicing with them every day and every night and you just got that feeling that something special could happen. And uh, to go out every Sunday or Saturday night and play these teams that we're playing, some of these big towns that we play, and just really dominate them and really <laughs> just go out and, uh, again, 11 games, we scored 295 points. We only gave up 38. Uh, we, we were just really the best team out there. The only team that could beat us would be ourselves, and the kids just really worked hard, really worked together, really pulled for each other. Right from August 1st till November 18th. It's just really a long season. Uh, they all showed up for practice every night. And again, it does get a little tedious or monotonous, but it, when you're driving for that championship, it really, what's the word I'm looking for? It really an excellent tribute to the kids who just come every night and play, listened to us, executed our game plan, and just really, again, dominated. There was no better team than us. And uh, I'm very, very proud. It's one of the better teams, me and my brother. I've been around with the PL a long time. And uh, I, I'll put them up there in my, my top five and everything. That really, really a good team. So with that, uh, we'll call up each player. All right, and thanks, Michelle. <laughs> okay, uh, Aaron Baxter. <laughs> Aileen Bowman. <laughs> Bryce Bradley. <laughs> Savian Carson. Cyrie Coleman. And, uh, Cyrie, multi talented, plays baseball and football, as you can tell. Ja Jahan Conway. Bryce Davis. Uh, whose father also played for the PAL and won a championship. John Del Rosso. Thank you. <laughs> Gabe Garcia. <laughs> Jason Hill. <laughs> DeAndre <laughs> Jenkins. <laughs> Makai Jenkins. <laughs> Dash Jones. Eden Jones. Ryan K. Schaefer. Brendan Kearns. Oliver Kick. Alex Kranz. Tiago Lovato. Weston Lipsy. <laughs> Brian Mantilla. <laughs> Nate Masson. <laughs> Timmy McColl. <laughs> Graylin Meeks. Emmanuel Miranda Jr. Nathaniel Mitchell. Ryan Morse. Tyrone Muldrow. Caleb Passels. T.J. Ware, Mark I. Williams, Xavier Williams, and Zach Williams.
everybody's for. Guys, move in. Move in. Move in. Close. Tight up. Get inside of you guys. Yeah. Some people got sick, so don't come up with it. Come on. Alright, look this way. Look up this way. Uh, welcome back, West Orange. Uh, we had a slight break uh, to let the crowds leave and also to set up for the next agenda item. Uh, what we're going to see, what we're going to see in here next, is a report from the West Orange Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, we're going to have Brian Feeney, Chairman, Marty Feitlowitz, Vice Chairman, and Patrick uh, Harshbarger, who uh, has been uh, the consultant uh, to the Commission for the last couple of years, I guess. Um, basically, the Commission has been getting for the last few years state grants to uh, fund surveys of various parts of town looking to identify historically and architecturally significant properties here in town, buildings and properties, uh, for recognition and potential designation as historic places. So uh, I just asked uh, uh, the folks to come up and just explain a little bit more to the town about the results of their work, which I, I hope you find interesting. I find it quite uh, fascinating, some of the work. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Feeney. And thank you for inviting us tonight. We, uh, we appreciate the visibility. Um, you know, we are an official arm of the township government, but a lot of times people ask, well, who are you? Are you an historical society? Are you this or that? Not at all. Um, we are part of the government. Uh, everyone who is, sits on the commission is appointed by, uh, by the mayor. Um, our nine members are made up of architects, preservationists, archivists, members of the arts community, and interested citizens. Now, anyone who's lived here in West Orange knows that the rich cultural history of the township is reflected in the incredible collection of 19th and 20th century properties that dot nearly every block here in the town. They interpret our history and they represent the, I'd like to think, the collective commitment that is shown throughout the West Orange community to preserving our history for future generations. And we all know how important that is because these are the sort of things that can change or disappear and then it's, it's, it's a loss to our history. We, you know, we here in West Orange really are a community. We're not, we're not a transit community with continual turnover. I mean, uh, there are people that live on my street that are second generation, um, and they never want to let those houses go out. They're, they expect their children to take those houses too. So um, it's, it, it is important that we always preserve what we can for future generations. Now, for our part, the Commission does two things toward that effort. Uh, first, we work to build and maintain an updated inventory and description of our commercial and residential properties here in the township. And then using that information, we recommend the most important properties to be designated by the council, and only the council has the authority to do that, um, to recommend that they designate them local historic landmarks. Um, we've been very fortunate that we have applied for and received grants from the state of New Jersey over the last few years, totaling about $50,000. Um, to be able to do these surveys. Uh, we don't do them ourselves. We have to hire a consulting firm who specializes in that. Um, but they are going to build a knowledge base for the township that will inform us, inform the planning board, the zoning board, the council, and be a great source of research uh, for anyone who wants to go to the library or eventually go online and see what these sort of things are about. Uh, and it really does paint a great picture of the town. And then for those <clears throat> properties that are designated and for any property, you know, if someone were to ask us for help, we always offer it. We work with the owners of those properties to guide them, <clears throat> excuse me, so that the restoration effort is always maintained and done within the standards of National Historic Preservation. Marty? This is not what I'm going to say. <laughs> 
I had to jot something down and I grabbed the nearest piece of paper and it was attached to other papers. Uh, yeah, historic preservation is uh, something very near and dear to me, at least over the last 20 years. It's been that long since I've been actually appointed to the Historic Preservation Commission. And uh, at first I was told, you know, you meet once a month, that's it, no, no effort. Uh, I figured I put in about 2,000 hours so far uh, over the 20 years. And uh, it's been an eye opener for me because I really didn't, as, as not a native born West Oranger. I was actually a native of Patterson, up, up the road a bit. But as someone who wasn't born into West Orange and its society, it's very rich in historic facilities. We may not realize it because so much of what's been done in recent years has caused some of those wonderful properties to go away, especially Mansion Row along the ridge, uh, where the General McClellan, actually Governor McClellan, uh, lived for uh, the time that he was governor. And they're all gone. And uh, I realize that if we don't work hard to try to preserve the architectural historical and cultural interests that have been held in this town for many years, uh, we're just going to look like any other place. But we're kind of special. We're very unique in that respect. And I just felt one quote would sort of sum things up. And this was written or stated by the first keeper of the National Register of Historic Places. So I don't know how far back that goes. But he said, it's been said that at its best, preservation engages the past in a conversation with the present over a mutual concern for the future. And I think that very succinctly sums up what it is that we try to do. So I just want to report to you that as of right now, today, there are two major projects going on in town. One you can see from this building, and that's St. Mark's Church. Uh, we can see the beginnings of the re-roofing that's going to take place and it's a very positive sort of the second step that's being taken the first step was to stabilize the walls this step will be to keep the weather from raining in or snowing into the building so it is rather slow but progress is being made we're working with them along the way we're, we're, we're trying to be very respectful of the past but we understand uh, the necessities of, of present-day finances. Uh, the other project is the Edison Battery Building, which is a little further down on Main Street. And I think you all begin to see the shape and form of it now. And uh, I think it's quite remarkable that we now have one of Edison's major buildings, the only one left other than his National Laboratory site, uh, restored instead of demolished. And then along with that, there has been other buildings that go on the site, and we've been watching those very carefully to see that they, in whatever way we can possibly influence it, comes out compatible to the historic building. So we want mostly the council to be brought up to date, but certainly all members of the public to know that we do exist. Uh, we are here, we're, we're all volunteers, but, uh, under our president, we've been able to accomplish an awful lot. And I think, Patrick, you have a nice story to tell. Um, it's been my pleasure over the past three to four years to uh, conduct a number of planning surveys of historical properties in West Orange. And I just want to follow up on what Marty said, that in my experience, West Orange is indeed a very historically unique place. You have an incredibly rich uh, number of historic buildings and historic landscapes here um, that um, really tell the story of this township and its families and its residents. Um, I've been doing this kind of work uh, since the late 1980s, so almost 30 years. I've worked all over New Jersey, and this is not hyperbole. It's, it's, it's really something, what you've got here. Um, 
You've got uh, a long valley road, houses that date back to the colonial period and the American Revolution. Uh, you've got uh, an amazing Llewellyn Park, which is a nationally significant, the model for the American suburb as it developed. Uh, it's an amazing, nationally known place. Uh, you've got great Victorians and Queen Anne's and mansion houses. You've got the unique topography that makes West Orange what it is as a, as a place. It's, it's near enough to Newark and New York City to have been one of America's first suburbs, but it's got the wonderful ridge with its views. It makes it really uh, an amazing place. So, um, and within that, there are diners and houses and commercial buildings and wonderful churches and wonderful schools. So I, I want to tell you a little bit about our surveys and what we've done. I've got about 10 slides. I'm going to try to hold it to about eight or nine minutes and uh, move rather quickly. But uh, as Brian said, um, um, the, um, this is the next slide. I can't really see. OK, there we are. Um, the, um, these, grant, these, plan, these planning surveys have been funded by uh, the New Jersey Historic Preservation Office. It has a, a competitive grants program, which the HBC has been very successful at. Uh, getting some of these grants. The money actually comes from the National Park Service uh, through the state to the township. Uh, so it's a, it's a federally funded um, project in the end, although the Park Service has very little direct involvement at the local level. The last time the township was surveyed was 1992. So it's been about 25 years. Uh, and so it was definitely time to do an update. A lot has changed in a quarter century. Um, and it was a, a good time to get a handle on this and to help the HPC uh, understand what, what had changed and what, what, what might not have been thought of as being particularly historic 25 years ago very often is today. Just to make a real quick point, when I started in this business in the 1980s, Victorian houses like Queen Anne's were sort of sneered upon by architectural historians. They were considered sort of gauche. Uh, and um, they, many of them were not considered particularly historic. Well now, uh, you know, beautiful Queen Anne houses are considered very historic. So tastes have changed, perceptions of history change over time. So it is important to update these surveys pr uh, frequently. Uh, you know, every, every 20 or 30 years is a good, a good benchmark, um, at least. Uh, and uh, we've surveyed 207 properties uh, in three neighborhoods, uh, St. Cloud, the Main Street Corridor, and Lower Gregory, and a little bit of Upper Gregory. And we've produced three volumes of reports, which are on file in the planning office. Uh, and as you can see from this slide, there's a, there's a survey form for every property we surveyed that includes photographs and maps, uh, little bits of history, descriptions. Most of the forms are somewhere between seven and 10 pages long. We do um, a, you know, as thorough a job as we can uh, in the time allotted. So the next slide. Our, um, our methodology in doing this is we use really pretty modern tools. We use GIS uh, for our mapping and we get coordinates and lot corners and building sizes and all that and it goes into uh, a, a file which we, we produce electronically. We do all our work in a Microsoft Access database which is getting a little old but it's the, the state standard at the State Preservation Office. Uh, we send out teams of architectural historians. We take photographs. We do all our work from the public right away on the sidewalks and the streets. We don't enter private property unless somebody comes out and asks us what we're doing and if they're interested. We have been invited in occasionally, but that's not our goal. Uh, we, we really uh, uh, respect private property rights, and this is a planning survey just to collect data from what we can see from the street. We develop what are called historic contexts which are histories of the neighborhoods, essentially, and how they fit into the overall township history and the state history. We do individual property researches using things like titles and old tax records and maps. And then at the end, we use uh, well-accepted criteria to determine if individual properties meet West Orange's landmark, local landmark criteria, which are essentially the same as the state and national register criteria. So next slide. Um, and so if you were to look into our reports, these are the kinds of things you would see about the different study areas. We do a lot of map analysis. There's some wonderful historic maps of, uh, this is of St. Cloud showing what it looked like in 1881. Black dots represent buildings and lines are property outlines. And you can see, um, you know, what a much less dense development pattern there was. 
but there were very large Queen Anne's being built along streets or on very favorable uh, lots for views. Uh, and so we, we do a lot of this kind of analysis. Uh, the next slide is the Main Street corridor. And uh, you know, we looked along Main Street from about St. Mark's up to just beyond Tory Corner. And uh, we surveyed um, uh, lots of commercial buildings, a little worker's neighborhood next to the Edison factory, uh, and some uh, the civic buildings here in town, the, the uh, churches, this building, um, the old school building, uh, and uh, get a sense of, of how the, that developed over time. Uh, and it's, a, it's an unusual main street because it, it sort of stretches out along the old Valley Road, and so it, it has a couple little distinctly characteristic areas. Torrey Corner is a little different from the area right around the Edison Labs, which is a little different from down here at St. Mark's. Uh, and they sort of create their own little vignettes of a main street as it developed in West Orange. And then finally, um, most recently, we surveyed the Lower Gregory neighborhood, which is a uh, classic, what we would call interwar neighborhood. It developed between World War I and World War II. And it's the first expressions of the automobile suburb. These are the first houses you're going to see that instead of carriage houses actually have garages. And uh, there are lots of revival styles, Gothic revival, Tudor revival, colonial revival, craftsmen. It's, a, it's an amazing mix uh, as, as uh, the suburbs spread out this direction. And you get to see some of the civic amenities that attract the people here, particularly the schools. There's a number of really finely built early 20th century schools there. So next slide. Uh, and then our reports end with our recommendations, and these are our professional assessments, of our most objective assessments of which of the properties we surveyed meet, in our judgment, the eligibility criteria that are set out in the township ordinance uh, for local landmark status, as well as potentially being listed on the New Jersey or National Registers of Historic Places. And of the 200-some-odd properties that we surveyed, it's our professional judgment that about 40 of them could be potentially eligible as local landmarks or for the New Jersey or National Registers of Historic Places. This doesn't mean they get listed, it just means they meet the criteria for listing. Uh, and our reports have tables like the one you see here, uh, which sort of summarize our findings and a little, a little thumbnail of each, each building and a brief description and our, our assessment. And then the next slide. Uh, and we also have produced some, uh, you know, some interpretive maps that summarize our results in a, in, a, in a geographic fashion. So this is the one for the Main Street corridor. And you can see by the different shading which buildings we surveyed, which buildings we thought, uh, or properties we thought had uh, uh, potential to be uh, listed as local or um, state or national landmarks. And uh, also, you know, there are some historic districts. Uh, Llewellyn Park is on the, already on the state and national register. And we, fe we have made some preliminary recommendations that there could be historic districts here too. So um, next slide. Uh, so how does this data all get used? Well, uh, it gets used by the Historic Preservation Commission, the Planning Board, the Zoning Board, in helping them to fulfill their responsibilities under the applicable township ordinances. Uh, and um, it also uh, should be used to inform uh, the historic preservation section of the township master plan when that gets next updated. Uh, you know, and, and these are uh, you know, mostly questions of uh, local landmarking uh, and planning and zoning. Uh, there's historical information. It tells about the materials of the houses, what are character defining characteristics that might be preservation worthy uh, under certain circumstances. And um, they're also used by state and federal agencies under their applicable laws. Um, these laws um, uh, really protect eligible properties from the actions of state and federal government. In other words, these are the kinds of things that, that, that they turn to if a new highway is going to be built or a road's going to be widened and, it, and it's going to end up like impacting the front yard of one of these glorious houses. They'll be looking at this to, to, to assess what kind of impact they're having on historic preservation. So they'll be using it from their planning point of view, but it's really not so much a local planning issue as only those projects that are funded and undertaken and regulated by agencies of state government or federal government. So we're talking about DOT, federal highways, DEP, those kinds of, of, of state and federal agencies. And then I think most importantly, really, um, 
these reports are, are out there to educate and inform the people of the township about the histories of their neighborhoods, about the histories of the properties they own. It's a great way to take some pride, to understand the generations that have come before you and things that make your place really unique from an historical point of view. And potentially for income producing properties, properties that are eligible can be, um, um, uh, can take advantage of federal tax credits for historic preservation, at least as things stand at the moment. And, um, and then finally, uh, two more slides. Um, so, okay, so what's next, Patrick? Well, um, you know, there are other neighborhoods to survey. There are grants every year. Um, so it's definitely something um, that the HPC should consider uh, continuing with. Uh, also, um, you know, this sets the stage for actually designating local properties uh, and, you know, the things that sort of, you, how do you choose which of those 40 properties to locally designate? Well, it has something to do with perceptions of threat, you know, level of support for the property owner and the community for designating it. It's a, it's a community decision. It's, it's one that's made here through the processes set out in the ordinance. I'm just advising you that I think it meets the criteria, not that you have to go do this, but this is something that starts through the process and can begin with your HPC. And then of course there can be public programs. Um, use some of this information to get out and give guided tours. You could do a historic house tour and encourage people to you know, come, and, come and enjoy their wonderful architecture and their beautiful houses. Uh, you could, uh, um, you know, Tory Corner has a wonderful history which could be sort of, uh, you know, massaged into um, uh, you know, creating an identity for the, for the shoppers who come there, a place to come and they sort of see that history as part of the shopping experience. So things can be done creatively with this information and it's really up to, to, to the community to decide what. And then finally, uh, just a few brief words about the National and State Register. Properties that are deemed to be eligible can be listed on the state and national registers. That can only be done with a private uh, property owner's consent. Uh, it does, as I said, give uh, protection against government undertakings. Uh, and uh, there's the tax credit that I also mentioned. But I think mostly it's a, it's a kind of a, a big warm hug from the National Park Service's National Register uh, to, uh, you know, recognize these, these amazing buildings and their history. And, uh, uh, you know, you can get a plaque and, and really uh, celebrate the houses and buildings that, that get listed. Uh, and there can sometimes be state grants um, as well for preservation projects. So that's uh, kind of a quick run through of what we've been doing. And I can entertain questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been sitting in the meetings and heard a lot of what I consider to be fascinating stories about some of these properties. If somebody such as me came to you in this moment and said, what would you say are the two properties in town that you think uh, residents would be most interested in hearing about? Can you give like a two minute on or a minute on those two properties? Well, it sort of puts me a little on the spot, but there, there, there are a couple that the, there, there, there are actually several that come to mind, but, but I think the one that, that is, uh, really blew my socks off uh, was the state diner. Uh, and you guys all know it, but, and there are a lot of diners in New Jersey, you know it, but, but uh, I, I couldn't believe it because it was closed the day I was there and I'm peering in the plate glass window and I'm looking at the finishings in there and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this, this is an amazing gem of a tiny little diner and, and, I mean, most of you probably know the diner stories about how they were prefabricated like railroad cars and, you know, shipped off and, uh, you know, if you bought a diner, you know, if you were somebody who wanted to get into the diner business, the guys that built the diner for you would come out and they would advise you on your menu and about how you would, you know, set up and how much, how many eggs you needed to buy and how many loaves of bread and, and particularly um, uh, in this part of New Jersey, uh, Greek immigrants were drawn particularly to this business and uh, and they weren't necessarily the ones building the diners, but they were getting a lot of advice from the people who, who built these diners, and it's a, it's a great story. And you've got one of, the, one, of, one of the hidden gems of a diner here. Um, the other uh, property that, that, that sort of uh, um, intrigues me is the, um, well, the, the, the one that, that the, the story everybody loves is about the mobster who, you know, this Wilman house where he, where he um, did himself in, and it, but it, but, but it has that history behind it. But it's an amazing Tudor revival 
house uh, of the of the of the um, 1920s period, and that that's a really really special place as well. I love the churches. I think you've got an amazing set of churches. Uh, I think particularly because they speak to a to a um, a period of time when West Orange was was clearly a suburb, but they were still into the image of being uh, a kind of a country place, a peaceful place. And so these churches look very much like they're modeled after the little parish churches of England and France and the small churches of New England towns and um, with a little bit, a few upgrades, but uh, you know, that, that's sort of the image they were going for and you've got an amazing set of those. Uh, and, and, and I really, you know, encourage the work that's being done at St. Mark's, but some of the other churches are also up at St. Cloud's, and the one up here that, that they, they built out of concrete in homage to Edison is, a, is another one that's, that's a nice church. Any other questions? Oh, was that the, it wasn't in any surveys? Right. Oh, okay. So we haven't had a chance to survey the Bamberger Mansion yet. We we just um, we've just finished Lower Gregory and we started on to the uh, the west side of Upper Gregory or Upper Gregory Avenue at sort of the north end, but haven't gotten very far yet. Great. Fabulous. I hadn't heard that. That's great. That's great. And I really enjoyed this picture because um, I own a school, school in town, mm -hmm. First Mountain, and I understand that the Canadian doctor that invented toboggans came to West Orange to test out his invention <laughs> right down First Mountain. So that's the picture that I have. <laughs> 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 I guess this Any other questions? Yeah. Any other questions in the back? Yes. Uh, you know, I was curious to find out, there, uh, there's a story down in the valley that there's a house on the corner of the valley where it turns to the south, south Valley and Forest Hill Road mm -hmm. uh, that, um, that George Washington stayed at or something of that nature, some history about that. Now I wonder if you found out any information about that. Um, that, that house uh, does date from the Revolutionary War period. Valley Road was here. Um, the, uh, I have not seen it substantiated that Washington actually slept there. That, that's, he did sleep some places, obviously, but, but uh, it, it, the, the question is, uh, can you go back to the documentary record and see in one of his letters that he says, I, I stayed with, you know, um, farmer so and so in his house this night, or I stopped there. What 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 most of these sort of Washington slept here stories are about is that we can prove that he definitely saw the house, because we know his route, the way he marched and the different routes he took. He he traveled Valley Road. You know, there's no doubt he saw that house. Did he actually stop there and visit? Uh, we don't know for sure. But that that's sort of where that kind of story comes from. It's a good one. Well, when we, when we look at it from a, a historic preservation perspective, what you're talking about are landscape elements. And when we do see what we think to be a historically significant landscape associated with the property, we do, we do consider that and bring it out as one of the character defining characteristics. We're often looking for walls, planting patterns, and those kinds of things. Uh, of course, the, you know, a tree's life, there, there are some trees that really can live you know, for hundreds of years, but most of the trees you see aren't, aren't that old. And one of the things about the, the, the register and the township ordinance is that our cutoff date is 50 years. It has to be 50 years old in order to be part of the historic fabric. And so, um, you know, when we look at a lot of those kinds of plants, very often they aren't quite that old. 
One more, and then let's... Mr. Hashford, would hmm? you care to comment on the historic markers that our little historian has been uh, putting in those on the street? Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I, I haven't I actually been out to read them all, so I don't want to, I can't comment on the content, but, you know, everything you can do to bring attention to it, and uh, you, you've, you've got, um, there are a lot of resources here for local history. I, I bring a sort of a perspective from sort of the, some, from the sort of the state level down to the local, and sort of, I, so I can make the comparisons, like, this is a really great Queen Anne, not just in West Orange, but anywhere. But, um, you know, there are people here who are really, truly experts in local history, and I rely heavily on their publications and input. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Harshbarger. Thank you, Mr. Feeney, Mr. Feinberg. Thanks very much for your patience. We'll, uh, we'll just pause in the meeting and clean things up, and then we'll get back going. Uh, next on the agenda is a nomination for council president, which is something we do every year uh, in December, and the term runs on the calendar year. I, this will be my last meeting unless something extraordinary comes up between now and January 1st. And I would just, just very briefly, I just want to say thank you uh, for the opportunity to further serve the council and the township of West Orange as uh, council president this year. I want to thank my colleagues. I want to thank the clerk and her staff. And I want to thank the administration for not only their help, but also their patience as I, as I got up to speed. And, I, I thought at the beginning of the year that it was going to be really nice not to have anybody ask me anymore, why aren't you council president? And that's actually happened. Nobody's asking me that. But what they're asking me is that, well, they're not really asking me. They're telling me that they thought I would be a better council president. <laughs> so no, so I would not. just like to say I think I improved a great deal from the first of the year to the end of the year. But oh, I appreciate my. everybody's uh, everybody's patience <laughs> and, and help. And. Uh, uh, I'm always going to uh, treasure this, this experience, so I appreciate it uh, for everybody. But uh, getting back to uh, the nominations for council president, uh, I don't know, does anybody want to say anything or do you want to just uh, nominate now? Well, I'd like to say something, but also make a nominate. But I'd like to say something first, okay. if it's okay, you your hand up, with the uh, council president and my council colleagues. First of all, thank you, council president, for guiding us through a year. Um, for your guidance and for your patience with a lot of issues and your foresight and um, I hope you had an enjoyable and educational experience and everything but uh, thank you and uh, it was a pleasure um, serving on the council with you as council president. Thank you. Um, so and if I may move forward council president if, if I'm allowed to right now is I'd like to make a nomination for our next council president and that would like to nominate councilwoman Susan McCartney for our next council president. Is there a second? Victor, you second that? Okay. Any discussion? Councilman. Uh, no discussion, but uh, Council, Council President, I would also like to echo the sentiment. And um, uh, it's really, uh, you know, the meetings run long sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's come up once or twice it's this year. It's a testament yes. to your passion and your commitment. You can't question that, OK? Um, so uh, we really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm glad that you know you've served us, and uh, and it's it's been a smooth ride. We appreciate that for the, We appreciate the guidance and the leadership. So thank, thank you, you for the show. Thank you, Councilwoman. Well, I would I would say a third for uh, Councilman McCartney, but Joe, thank you. I, you did a nice job. You know, we had some long meetings, but we we do a lot here up uh, up in the chamber, and it's hard because you know folks come up and they're passionate about. Of giving us information, asking us a lot of questions, and you know, we try to get everybody answers, and I think that that's been done this year. So, thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Okay. So, we've got a motion and a second. Does anybody want to say? I Councilwoman, would you like say. to defend your nomination? <laughs> I will say thank you for the nomination. I accept the nomination. And I wanted to say to Joe that uh, though we don't always, we have not always seen eye to eye. I do appreciate, and I promise to em emulate, um, the how you preserved order and decorum uh, throughout the whole year, yeah. at, at really at every meeting. And I do appreciate that, and I promise that uh, I will continue that. Thank so, you. on that note, we have a motion on the floor. Well, yeah, is there any other nominations? The, right. Is there any other nominations? Okay. We'll take a vote. Councilwoman Casalino? Yes. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> Council President Kropowiak. Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Yes. Congratulations. Councilwoman McCartney will be our next uh, council president. Yes. In the meantime. Congratulations. Congratulations. We would like to, on behalf of the members. Give a round of applause for ourselves. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to read what it says. It says, in appreciation for your dedicated service and commitment to the Township of West Orange and your leadership role as council president. Thank you very much. Yep. Appreciate it. Nice job. Uh, as you've probably noticed, Mayor Parisi is, is uh, present tonight, and he had just asked to be allowed to say a few words, so you say as many as you'd like, Ken. Mayor. Thank you. thank you, Council President, and thank you for giving me a few moments. Um, we all, it's not hard to be disheartened when we look at the nature of our political discord in this country. Um, I don't think any of us exaggerate when we say that it certainly seems a lot worse than it maybe ever has. We often like to talk about how West Orange is a microcosm for this country, and sometimes I wish that the country took us as an example in mm -hmm. their political discord. I've been a member of council for, for 19 years involved in government here in West Orange, and every year, no matter who was on the council, who was the mayor, and who was the council president, we all work together for the good of the community to ensure that we do what ultimately is our primary responsibility, keep the public safe and deliver the services uh, that people are expected to. Uh, Council President, it's no secret you and I don't always agree on process, <laughs> um, but I'll say that uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you uh, this year and any of those disagreements on process was always put aside in working with Jack and John for the good of the community and I'd like to thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. And uh, just to end off, Sue, it's obviously uh, we've worked with you before. We'll look forward to it. Um, you've been here a long time. You're a glutton for punishment. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but as always, the administration is here to support the council in our combined efforts in supporting the community. Thank so you. best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, also this time of year, the <coughs> council uh, determines who's going to be council li liaison to the various organizations that we support uh, generally through uh, an ordinance uh, that we have here in the municipality that actually tells us that we need a liaison. So there's a list in the, uh, uh, in the conference agenda. Uh, I don't know what their agenda items are on here, but just want to go through them, I think, fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'll do is I'll just announce it, and then if anybody has a, uh, a nomination, please just raise your hand, I'll recognize it. The first, uh, the first item is the planning board. Uh, Councilman McCartney is the uh, liaison for the moment, or for the year. Does anybody have any nominations? I, I nominate. Her. Well, we don't really need oh, to we don't need nominate, nominate okay. because I'm gonna be doing a resolution in okay. the first meeting of next year just to appoint everybody. So I just need to know who's going to be appointed to these committees. So it oh, doesn't okay. necessarily need to be a nomination. Yeah. Just as, you I know. Guess we could do it where, do you see any changes? We right. Just, yeah. Well, let okay. me just ask you, Susan, would you like to continue as yes, planning board? Is Thank everybody you. okay with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. good, we got that one. See what I mean about patience? I should know this. This is what, <laughs> my seventh year when we're doing this? Okay. Uh, Local Assistance Board, Councilman Kasselini, sure. would you like to continue? Yes, I'm fine with that. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. yes. Uh, Degnan House, uh, Councilman Cirillo is the uh, liaison. Yes, Councilman. Would you like to continue? Yes. Everybody okay? Yes. Uh, the Renna House, uh, Councilman Garino is the liaison. You want to continue? Thank you, Council President. Everybody okay with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Downtown West Orange Alliance, uh, Councilman uh, Garino is the liaison there. Would you like to continue? Thank you, Council Everybody President. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, the West Orange Municipal Alliance Committee. This is uh, Councilwoman Casalino. Would you yeah. like to continue? Yes. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. West Orange Arts Council. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes, thank you. Everybody okay? okay. Great. Continue. Open Space and Recreation Committee. That's, uh, I'm the liaison there. I'd like to continue. Everybody Absolutely. okay with that? Great. 
And the Public Relations Commission, Councilwoman Castellino, would you like to continue? Yes. Everybody okay with that? Yep. Great. Super. Uh, can I just we good? Oh, mm -hmm. see, how see how cooperative I, I've been serving uh, now as an unofficial. Do we need to be official with the uh, liaison to the West Orange Board of Education? We don't oh. have that on here. Yeah, we haven't. Right. We've like never to, made like that. To, you know, we never continue made. serving as. It's, it's not on the ordinance. It's not in the ordinance. Yeah, it's, 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 it's more of an informal. Okay. So. Yeah, no, so it doesn't need okay. a resolution. Okay, everybody's good with me. Can we have a meeting? Mm -hmm. Talking to my school board friends. Okay. Yeah, like I've I've sort of made myself the liaison for the Historic Preservation Commission, yeah. but that's not. Oh, that's in the right. Ordinance. That's not on here. Also. So I just come okay. and talk. You know. Right. Right. So we're good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, next uh, item is uh, downtown redevelopment. Mr. Sayers. Downtown redevelopment is moving along very, very nicely. Um, the new things, as I said before, they've been putting in the plumbing and the electricity, so everything's getting tied in and ready to go. They're still saying that they may do something um, by April, um, but I'm still not sure if that's going to happen. But um, they are making a lot of progress, I can tell you that. Hmm. And when you say something, you mean actually ha having tenants move in? Having okay. Been, yes. Councilwoman? Um, the storefronts, I see, are they designated? Like where we see openings for doors, I guess? The whole bottom are they? floor is going to be storefronts. Everything are they all that. leased already? Do they know who's coming They're in? They're not or? all leased yet, no. Because some of them look like doorways, but then some of them don't. I yeah. just couldn't tell what they were doing. As far doing as I yet. know, they're not all leased. Okay. They're still talking to people. Actually, I, I heard yesterday, and I tried to verify it today, but I wasn't able to get in touch with my the guy down there. But uh, supposedly they're talking about a Starbucks can in there. <laughs> really? You need to speak into the yeah, microphone yeah. with <laughs> that news. Especially on that news, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Sayers. Talking, what was that again? They're talking about <laughs> having a Starbucks in there, and and they're hoping to get that hoping to get that Jojo done. Starbucks. Yep. Jojo Starbucks. That's what they meant. Yeah. And but I don't know that for a fact yet. And the parking deck, when will that be? Parking okay. decks, I think, is, is, I don't think it's completed, but it's pretty much almost completed. It's, oh. it's all up in the back. You can't see it because yeah. the, the, the R over R in the front blocks the deck. So you can't actually see the deck. Which is nice. Yeah, that's, it was yeah. all oh, designed yeah. that way. Okay. I'll catch you. Council President. That's Done? it. That's all I got. Councilman. Thank you, Council President. Mr. Sarah, you know what I'm going to ask, right? Um, <laughs> let me think. Uh, to be quite honest with you, I have, is, go ahead. No, I'd like to know, is there any marketing packages yet, any marketing scope? I, I haven't seen an official marketing package, but I know they are out marketing on their own. Is there anything we can get from, um, from them to get an idea of how they're marketing it and, and who they're marketing it? I can talk to them and see if they, I'm pretty sure they don't have an official marketing package, but I know they're out there marketing and talking with businesses and, and, and uh, other entities to come into the building. But I will uh, find out if they'll do or something. Is, or is it also possible, could I meet with them? Absolutely. You okay, can, anybody like, can meet with them anytime oh. they want. I mean, they're very open to whatever they want us, what, whatever okay. they want to do. If you I want, I can sit down, I can call Mr. Terrell and give me a call when you're available and we can sit down with him. Okay, thank you. I like that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Council President. Certainly. Councilman Sir, Yes, okay. thank you, Council President. Just in terms of the completion date you mentioned, like maybe beginning to fill the units in April? That's just the R over R in the front. Yeah. The That's the front building. That's not the <coughs> major warehouse. Just refresh my memory and maybe we need to re I need to revisit the documents. What's the estimated completion date? Are For we, that building? Yeah. The end, the end of 2018. The end of 2018? I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'd have to check sure the document because we, we, we redid the document, and I'm not yeah. sure what date okay. is in there, to be honest with you. So I don't want to say one date when I really don't know exactly what so it is. But I'll check it. The outside of the whole project was three years. You yeah. know, they don't yeah. anticipate that. Right. Three, 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 three years, years from the entire, year. for the entire project. Right. right. Okay. So um, when does the, uh, the, 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 the tax... Uh, the tax abatement kick in. When people start moving in. Yeah, when people, people start moving in. So if it's in April, yeah, it was 2019. Yes. Unit by unit. Unit by unit. Okay. That's how that works. Yeah, it's a pro rata. 
pro yeah. Oh, pro rata. Okay. Pro -rata. But. Okay. So so lastly, um, so uh, there is no degree of urgency right now with respect to the uh, occupancy of the commercial. Um, yeah. We shouldn't worry about whether or not they're going to fill the stores. I don't think Still you should sense. worry at all. Oh, this no, is I don't think you're going to. This is not okay. a pro This project does in all the years I've been doing this. Yeah. The, the construction moves slow at times. It's the it, construction that moves slow. Once the construction's over. But there's activity, and, right. and, it, and it's not insignificant. I just don't want us to, to have that impression if that's not the case. No, I don't, I don't we're find within that. the time frame. Look, look, a, an easy project usually takes 18 months. Mm -hmm. So and this is not an easy project. So they've got, I still don't think it's going to take three years, but I think it's an easy two years. Okay. So. And I know you had the experience, Mr. Gross, in South Orange, and you've seen some of those redevelopment projects through. Uh, and I'm glad to hear about the Starbucks. I, I hope there's something we can do to try to uh, motivate interest uh, from the corporation. We've been trying to do that for a while with Starbucks. Yeah. We just can't find the right location for them. But from what I had heard, and I don't know it for a fact, I'm hearing that they're, they may even have the Starbucks in, signed up. So I'm, I'm going to try and find that out. I tried to find it out today, but Mr. Terrell was obviously busy and calling back. Thank you for the time, Principal. When, if, if and when you confirm that, would you just send a quick email to the council? Absolutely. Because I'm sure this is going to be burning up the uh, <laughs> the internet. Uh, probably already is. Probably crashing the internet. If I could, Councilwoman, Councilwoman, yeah. just before yeah, ask, I just wanted to clarify that. something. Um, I believe that the redevelopment agreement says that the redeveloper does not start paying under the pilot for two years after they uh, obtain the CO. Is that correct? No, I don't because think that's, that. the, that's the ramp up period where they get the CA, CO, then people can start moving in, and, but they don't have to pay until they, the they have up to two years. It will probably take two years and then, for, to get, for an, as an absorption rate of 333 yeah. units to fill up. But my understanding and, and is, is that, and we've had discussions about this, that this is gonna start as they begin, as they begin to rent, uh, there will be um, uh, pilot payments being forwarded. Okay. Because so I remember the old agreement, the old redevelopment agreement, did give the two-year yeah, period from the right. CO, and I couldn't remember from the new agreement. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. My, yeah, everything I know about it is okay. I'll, I'll, I'll read the documents and yeah. by the next okay. meeting. And I have two hands up. Did you want I to respond to, to that? I just want to respond to this because what I recall when we had the presentation on the financial schedule, that that schedule began in 2019. So it may be what you're saying. I don't re remember it saying two years, but I, it would be two years, um, you know, in conjunction with what you're saying. But I do remember the schedule starting at those payments starting in 2019. Well, we'll get that clarified okay. for the next meeting. Councilwoman. Yeah, I, I uh, well, first to, uh, what I was going to say, but I do recall as soon as the, the leases are activated, that's when it would, payments would start and better that we, you know, starting with the commercial, the higher end. Um, but just to reiterate, I know everybody's concerned with the leases, but when we were on site a while ago with Mr. Cohen, uh, Councilman McCartney and I, uh, and we were, you know, digging at him to, you know, what kind of um, commercial retail he was looking for there. Yeah, he, he has a plan. So I, I know we're always having this conversation about who's going to be coming in, but they know who they want, and they're going to cater you know, to, to what they want for, for their residents. And I got that message loud and clear, and f some feedback I'm getting back from some realtors I know in the business that have had conversations with them. Um, I'm getting that read. They're, the rent is going to be a little higher there, and but they know exactly what they want for their residents. So, I well, think I think they have it covered. So plus we'll, we'll see. Sorry. Plus they have a pent up demand over the past yeah. few years of people that have expressed interest. Mm -hmm. That's the first place they're going to go through that yeah. first, and, and they're, they're going to lose probably 50 to 65 percent of that. Uh, but that other third it will take serious interest in it, whether they whether they're able to absorb them or not. But th that's where they're going to go first. They're not going to spend money on advertising until they, they see where, what happens with the, they're, al they're already pent up demand. <coughs> that's why I just wanted to okay. reiterate that comment I mentioned in, in the past. Okay. So there isn't concern out there. Uh, Mr. Gross, I know I, I nag you on this sometimes, but 
you have some usually have some very important things to say. So if you could speak a little bit more into the microphone, I'm not sure everybody can can hear you. Um, Mr. Sayers, I, I saw where uh, Prism became current on their delinquent November taxes. Current. Did you did you have anything to do with that? Did you send them a nasty letter or anything? No, I actually placed a phone call. So uh, they came Good. out. Actually, when I spoke to uh, Mr. Diaz, he wasn't aware of. Actually, what it, what actually happened was part of the taxes were paid, but all of them were not paid. And when I spoke to him, he had them send the checks. Over. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, liaison, council liaison announcements. Speaking of the devil, anybody like to speak uh, sure. first? Councilman. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Council President, and my colleagues. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say we had a fantastic. West Orange Holiday Open House on this past Saturday. It was great weather, a great turnout, particularly the uh, Breakfast with Santa Claus at Washington School. Over 200 uh, family members came and had Breakfast with Santa Claus. I'd like to make a big shout out to Marie DeMeo, the principal yeah. of, West Or of uh, Washington School for the use and to the Board of Education for the use of the facility and for uh, also to Joe Fagan, our town historian, for a fantastic historical presentation about the historical makeup and uh, items and locations and homes and people who uh, made the downtown uh, corridor and it was fantastic, uh, as uh, Councilwoman McCartney said too, we had over 350 people riding uh, the trolley up and down Main Street and we all had a good time. Uh, I can speak for my colleagues, I think we all had a good time giving the residents an idea of the history of Main Street and the people and people throughout the township and uh, I've gotten numerous emails, I, I know Councilwoman McCartney's gotten emails and I know my other colleagues that people are asking questions so they're really excited about uh, the, the history of West Orange and, and the history uh, of the corridor. I want to also uh, thank the county and the county executive for the use of the uh, trolley. Uh, we appreciate every year the county uh, gives us the opportunity to use it and so we hope we get it for many, many more years. Um, and that's what, and I said, I just hope more people you know, come out to the downtown corridor. There's some great businesses. And speaking of some great businesses in the corridor, uh, we have works, um, City Works. Uh, men's clothing store on Main Street, which was just voted one of the top 10 small businesses in Essex County. And we're very happy for Roger and Josefina for them and for their dedication to the downtown corridor. And Susie Q's was voted one of the uh, top 10 uh, barbecue locations in Essex County. So a big shout out to Susie. Um, and uh, like I said, please uh, merchant, come down to our merchants, uh, shop there. Uh, there's a lot of great things between Schneider Hardware and all the other merchants along the Main Street corridor, and um, hopefully you'll find something you never knew um, existed before. And I thank all my council colleagues for helping out at the um, holiday open house and for the trolley ride on behalf of the Downtown West Orange Alliance, and also for the great Christmas tree lighting we had. It was a great turnout. So it was a fun-filled day and really brought the community together. And that's what you know, I know we all like to see, is people coming down and talking instead of being on their phones all day long. So <laughs> it was nice to see you know, people actually talking, meeting new people, you know, Santa Claus. And a, a big shout out to the Public Works Department, the West Orange Fire Department, the West Orange Police Department for their help in making the holiday weekend a great success. And thank you to all and thank you to my colleagues. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Councilwoman? You want to go next? Or That's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, just to uh, piggyback on uh, Councilman Garino's uh, comments, but yeah, gr great day, gr good time. Love the kids, uh, just adorable, nothing like a, the Holiday Bazaar. I like the way we did it this year with Joe Fagan. Joe Fagan doing a little presentation, um, educating um, the, the trolley riders, made our jobs easier because we could just quiz people instead of remember all the facts that, you know, you can never keep up with Joe Fagan. There's just so many facts <laughs> and he's such a, uh, such a treasure of knowledge for us. Uh, but it, it worked out really nice. Uh, the library had Build-A-Bears, they were a big hit. So a lot more activities, uh, the breakfast, again, we did that years ago at uh, Lady of the Lord's School, um, the town did, and I'm glad uh, Meg brought that back. But Meg and Bill, really, you know, great effort by her and the whole downtown uh, committee. And the recreation department, phenomenal job last Saturday night with all uh, our rec and fire, so thank you. And Unique Performance Dance uh, Company had performed and Roosevelt Middle School was on hand to entertain everyone. Um, next Thursday the 14th, we will have our menorah lighting 
uh, right here in, town, in front of Town Hall at 4 p.m. So um, we will have that for our residents, another uh, night of celebration. And uh, Councilman, you have the other holiday uh, flyer that you could share with the residents. Uh, this also past weekend, West Orange Arts Council had a holiday bazaar. Um, great handcrafted items, um, great shopping, great opportunities for sh to shop local, even last Saturday after Thanksgiving, shopping down on Main Street. So just remember our local businesses here in the township. There's so many great uh, businesses, not only just in the downtown quarter, but throughout the, the township. So just try to remember them. I know I appreciate not standing in those long lines in the mall. A lot nicer coming uh, to our local shops. Uh, also on Thursday, uh, the 14th, we have a public relations meeting at 6 p.m. Uh, down here uh, in I'm sorry, in the count, uh, conference room down the hallway here at 6 p.m. on the 14th. Uh, open to the public, so if you want to get involved, uh, please do so. And my last announcement is, oh wait, we have Toys for Tots on Thursday night, December 7th, and our Pee Wee cheerleaders that were here earlier with some of the other pal cheerleaders be on hand to perform that evening. Um, but you could bring uh, Toys for Tot Thursday night. Uh, Ron Charles uh, on the school board works with St. Jude and has this really nice uh, event um, at, um, oh, what's it, 460? 466 on Prospect Avenue. So that's 6 p.m. this Thursday night at 7 o'clock. And that is it. I'm looking forward to um, January, probably February 1st. We'll have the senior citizen survey uh, results back where we're going to bring Montclair State in. Uh, over 800 residents have participated in the study, which we're really excited about. And uh, thank you to the health department and many of our residents. Rosary, you were, you were here out peddling, the, peddling our uh, survey, and we appreciate that. Also, uh, Josie Velez worked really hard, and so many of you residents out there getting the word out about it. So we're looking forward to the information, and we'll have a full report uh, that we'll look forward to in, in the next uh, meeting or two. Council President, thank you. done. Councilman Cerullo? Sure. Uh, Council President, the Degnan House uh, is, uh, is currently uh, uh, being, uh, it's, it's, it's planning uh, to get uh, the uh, site ready for an inspection by HUD. Uh, there was an article that we had spoken about. And uh, since then, um, the property manager, Debbie Solonardi, has uh, procured the services or will be procuring the services of a professional inspector to come in and, and, and take a look at the facility and make sure that uh, you know, whatever uh, fi um, physical scores uh, came out the, the past, uh, this past year, uh, is now repeated. So uh, just want to give credit to the board for being proactive and making sure that, uh, you know, that situation doesn't repeat itself. So that's the report for the uh, Degnan House. Uh, as a release to the West Orange Hispanic Foundation, our council president, there's a tour drive that's going on. Uh, if anybody has uh, toys that they wish to donate, uh, the toys can be donated to um, the restaurant uh, Fogon Latino, uh, 41 Washington Street, 41 Washington Street, until Friday, August 15th. Uh, unwrap toys, which... December 15th or August 15th? December 15th. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. December. Uh, December 15th. I'm sorry. I'm a little under the weather, and I don't know why I wrote August 15th. Because <laughs> it feels like it's days. August 15th. <laughs> <Seriously. laughs> right. So, uh, not um, August, but uh, on December 17th at 3 p.m., there's going to be a toy giveaway, Council President, at Holy Trinity Church. Uh, this is uh, for the uh, children in the neighborhood. Uh, any toys that are collected will be distributed on that, on that date. And again, that's on behalf of the West Orange Hispanic Foundation. Uh, and lastly, with this being um, the last meeting of the year, I just want to wish uh, the, the public you know, all of our, uh, our partners uh, to come in and, and provide us uh, feedback. Uh, warm and uh, wonderful holiday season uh, to all. Thank you. Councilman. Thank you, Councilman. Just a, just a quick clarification. The toys for yes. the toy drive, I, I'm assuming new would be great, but are they also accepting gently used? Uh, we'll take them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do they need to be wrapped or unwrapped? Uh, unwrapped. We'll take unwrapped. care of that. Okay. That's, again, that's until December 15th. Okay. Okay, so contact either myself or you can get in touch with um, Deputy Mayor Rodolfo Rodriguez. Uh, that is the, uh, his restaurant. Uh, yep. Again, Fogon Latino uh, on 40, at 41 Washington Street. 
Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you. Council. Thank you. It is a busy time of year. 3 p.m. Busy time of year. Um, the mayor's program for individuals with special needs for having their holiday party on Sunday, December 17th from 4 to 7 at the Toby Katz Fieldhouse. Um, but are welcome to attend. Um, and visit the West Orange Recreation Department for a lot of upcoming things. You, as you saw today, so many things happening in recreation. Uh, West Orange Chamber of Commerce, save the date for January 31st for the annual State of the Town Address given by the Mayor Parisi. This will be held at the Wilshire Grand on Wednesday, January 31st from 8 to 9.30. Tickets are $35. Uh, they will be available here in the Mayor's office and also at westorangechamber.com. Uh, everyone is invited to attend. And um, the, the West Orange Chamber of Commerce also puts out a chamber directory. So if anybody would like to um, submit content for the directory or advertise in the directory, um, please send information to, again, westorangechamber.com. Um, that gets mailed townwide. Um, thank you for the holiday open house. Just really was an outstanding. And, and also to all the volunteers, not only Recreation and Public Works and Police and Fire, but we had volunteers from the Girl Scouts. We had the, the Junior kids. ROTC the volunteers. Um, the cadets did an outstanding yes. job in preparation, uh, preparing the site, and also in cleanup committee. So great uh, young batch of students. Um, and if you recall, uh, a couple years ago, uh, two, actually 2015, this was with the West Orange Environmental Commission. We introduced Leader of Light, I'm spelling L-I-T-E-R, where the founder, Elac Diaz, uh, discovered that if you fill a liter bottle with water and a little bit of bleach, it would provide five hours of solar energy, he, solar light. He used it in the Philippines when the country was devastated without, from the typhoon uh, with no electricity. They came and gave that presentation to the Environmental Commission at the Thomas Edison National Historic Park during one of our Earth Hour events back in 2015. And it was, no pun intended, but the light bulb went off that after five hours, you need night light. So right after that, um, the members of the Environmental Commission, High School, and um, Downtown Alliance met with Evco Mechanical quiet little company on Standish Avenue, been there, mechanical company, been there um, many, many years. Um, and you're sitting in a room of MIT engineers and they build us a prototype of a nightlight. I gave that to the high school students, the director, the supervisor of the sustainable engineering and technology course at the high school. He wrote a curriculum that would help build this solar circuit and it went on to be a national um, national recognition. Leader of Light is right now on a world tour and we just got word from them that they don't want to head back home to the Philippines until uh, they stop here in West Orange. Oh, great. Yeah, so they're bringing a lot of supplies with them. It's, this will be at the high school. I'm just throwing this out there because I understand they're bringing 500 circuits. Um, 2.30 on Monday, December 11th, um, if you'd like to build a solar LED circuit, um, you can join us at the high school in room 1226. I'm just very excited and it just literally put West Orange on the map with a national curriculum that was recognized back in May and, um, and just this program and the great work that's being done at the high school. The Environmental Commission also launched a campaign for field goods F-I-E-L-D, Field Goods, which um, is 60, a collaboration of 60 sustainable farms in our area where you can have fresh produce delivered uh, right here in town. We have three sites, First Mountain Preschool, Metropolitan Plan Exchange, and the library is on board now. Um, uh, that's three so far, so we're looking for more sites. But it's an online, you order yourself, you can either um, accept what they're offering for that week or build your own bag. It's very reasonable and it gets delivered to one of those sites. So fieldgoods.com, check it out. Um, and many of you are here, know that the planning board meeting is tomorrow evening, 12-6. This we have t a courtesy hearing from the county. The county is looking to renovate the existing entrance 
and also the renovations to the a leopard exhibit. Uh, we ha also have the presentation that was carried from the November 1st meeting on the preliminary investigation report proposing the non-common condemnation area need of redevelopment at Essex, Essex Green. And there is another recommendation to the council that will be presented about the Eagle Rock commercial area that we discussed uh, a long time ago. So that's for the agenda December 6th. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, I uh, <laughs> want to invite everyone to consider attending the 19th annual Kwanzaa celebration. It's going to be Friday, December 29th from 5.30 to 9 o'clock at the Washington Elementary School in the gymnasium, 289 Main Street. Uh, there will be refreshments, music, African dancing, and vendors. It's free admission. If you've never gone before, you're, you would be amazed at how entertaining uh, the evening is. and. Uh, uh, would really just uh, invite everyone to come. It's uh, Friday, December 29th, 5.30 to 9 at Washington <coughs> Elementary School. Just two quick follow-ups to uh, what Councilman Garina was saying about the, the trolley tours. Two very interesting things happened, at least I thought they were interesting. Uh, I did a couple of the tours with my wife. Uh, my wife was born and uh, raised here and is, knows a lot about architecture, so she comes and helps out on the, on the tours. The first thing, on our first tour, uh, I looked up because somebody called my name inside the bus and it was Michelle Martin who is a uh, trustee or a director at the Friends of the West Orange Public Library. She had just gotten married the week before and apparently they took time out of their honeymoon <laughs> to come on, on the trolley tour. So I thought that was funny so I announced it to everybody and they got a big round of applause and I don't think she's ever going to talk to me again. <laughs> no, she told me she wasn't. No. Okay. So, and then the, on the next tour, it was very interesting because uh, my wife, when she was born, when Claire was born, she lived at, I believe it's 139 Main Street. It's one of the, it's the uh, row of buildings just uh, south of the Edison site. And it's, uh, it's a, row of build, a row of residences, usually two, some three family that uh, I think Edison bought for his workers. And her family lived in the, the one of the two families, I think it's at 139. So she announced that as we're driving by. And there's a woman, I swear, sitting in the front seat of the bus said, that's where I live. Mm -hmm. oh. So that was just really, that was just really funny. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I know the meeting's running long, but I just thought those two things would be kind of interesting. Anyway, I think that's, uh, is that it mm -hmm. for the conference agenda? Mm -hmm. So we can now move to the public uh, agenda, yes. Madam Clerk. This is to inform the general public that this meeting is being held in compliance with Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975. The annual notice was emailed to the Star Ledger and filed in the Township Clerk's Office on November 28, 2016, and published in the West Orange Chronicle on December 8, 2016. Councilwoman Casalino? Present. Councilman Cirillo? Present. Councilman Garino? Present. Councilwoman McCartney? Present. Council President Krakowiak? Present. Will everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Council is now in their public meeting. At the start of our agenda is public comment. For those of you who haven't done this before, if you'd like to come and speak, uh, you will have five minutes. Please raise your hand, be recognized by the chair. One of the things we've been trying to do to speed up the meeting is to, once you're recognized by the chair, please come down in the first row or two so we can reduce the amount of time between speakers. Uh, you have five minutes. You can say anything. Uh, stay within general bounds of civility and uh, five minutes. Typically what the council does is in, in administration is we wait till everybody speaks and then <laughs> responds if there are any specific questions or any comments that they want to make. So would there like to be anyone uh, who speaks a public comment tonight? I see Ms. Morelli at the back, please. Would you start us off? I see Mr. Ms. Malanga, if you'll just come on down. I see Mr. Daniel. I just found out it was Dr. Daniel, right? Yes. See, I do read your emails. <laughs> is there anyone else besides these four that I've Select, does anybody else like to speak? We've got our county representative here, too. You usually want to wait till last? Say the best to last? Okay. <laughs> Maybe he should come up first. He sits through all of this stuff. <laughs> Torture. Do you want to come up here, Anthony? Thank you, Ms. Morelli. He does like to go last. You want to go last? 
Yeah, he's told me that he really wants to wait until he hears what you have to say. So please. He's going to be interested. Anyway, what I'd like to say is uh, you did an outstanding job, Mr. Krakowiak. Uh, one thing I watched was you followed parliamentary procedure, you followed Robert's rules of order, and also the ordinance of the council. Hopefully that will continue. You did an outstanding job. Thank you. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about two issues. One, senior citizens and tax abatements. Now on tonight's agenda, resolution 246-17, the Essex County Department on Aging contract for funding for a visiting nurse, which is a service provided by the Township Health Department. I wasn't aware that this program was still in place. Apparently it isn't too well publicized. But objective number eight in the resolution states, quote, to review the results and report from the senior citizen survey to determine unmet needs, end quote, which hopefully will rectify the problem going forward. And for those of you who might not be aware, last August I was appointed to be a member of the Essex County, <coughs> excuse me, Commission on Aging by our county executive, Joseph DiVincenzo and I was approved by the County Board of Chosen Freeholders. And one of my first objectives is to make the senior citizens of our township aware of all the senior services that are available. Um, I'm, tomorrow I'm picking up from the county 40 copies of this publication. It's the Essex County Division of Senior Services and the Aging and Disability Resource Connection Programs and Service Guide. It's an excellent comprehensive program. I'll give some to you, Karen, and I will also give them some to Addie Duffy. And I will, yeah, I will keep getting them and bringing them in. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. County newspaper. Nice. Doesn't get distributed, gets here and we lose it. I don't know where it goes. So you'll get more of those. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the usage of redevelopment and rehabilitation tax abatements by New Jersey municipalities. I have another report. This one is a programmatic examination of municipal tax abatements, and this. Uh, is a report that reviews the usage of redevelopment and rehabilitation tax abatements. The review was submitted to Governor Christie, Stephen Sweeney, President of the Senate, and Sheila Oliver, the Speaker of the Assembly, on August 18, 2010. The review was done by then State Controller A. Matthew Boxer, who was a very talented young man, Ex exceptional, really exceptional. Now the executive summary and the entire report are too lengthy to read here tonight. I haven't got too much time left, but you can find this on the uh, state web website. It's an absolute have to read. Uh, just something from the executive summary. Our review of tax abatement practices in New Jersey found numerous weaknesses in the regulation, implementation, and oversight of these programs, including Payments to municipalities by business and developers in lieu of taxes, known as pilot payments, distort municipal incentives in using and structuring abatements at the expense of, count of counties, school districts, and other taxpayers. Information concerning statement agreements, abatement agreements is not published in a transparent manner or centralized location, making it difficult to impossible for the public to compare, to calculate the effect of, or be fully aware of these agreements. Many of the municipal criteria and processes used in evaluating potential abatement agreements are weak. Uh, this is a good one. Municipal follow-up on abate, abatement terms and benefits generally is lacking, impeding accountability and feedback. Who better fits this than PRISM? Another thing, and I hate to go there, but cronyism may emerge. 
in the approval process of the long-term abatements, further compounding these inequities. Cronyism provides unfair advantages to favored developers and in the process can lead to less beneficial terms for the municipality and other affected parties. Historical evidence of corruption of the redevelopment process in New Jersey confirms that this threat is real in the long-term abatement context. Your time is up. Please, if you could, Ms. Morelli, finish up. I have just one more to read, yes, please. please. Uh, significant use. These are where abatements are used continually. Uh, significant use of development abatements. Asbury Park, these are the townships that <laughs> municipalities take advantage of this. Asbury Park, Atlantic City, Bayonne, Bridgeton, Camden, Harrison, Hoboken, Jersey City, uh, Long Branch, New Brunswick, Boundbrook, Vineland, Trenton. Um, Thank you, Ms. Riley. My is next that, point, just one little point. My next point 10 is- 10 seconds, please. Uh, these are too long to go into, but my opinion, because as a suburban municipality, two problems could exist in West Orange. One is property maintenance ordinance is not being enforced and properties are falling into disrepair or the properties being identified as qualifying in need of redevelopment actually aren't. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morelli. Ms. Malanga, would you like to go next? Good to Please. see you all. Tomorrow evening, Can you state your name and address. Sally Malanga, 57 Ridge Road. Thank you. Tomorrow, citizens will return to the planning board hearing on the Essex Green and Executive Drive proposals, as well as the Eagle Rock and Prospect Avenue, consisting over a dozen properties, all attempting to be made into areas in need of redevelopment by the Township Administration. This is a massive real estate scheme which lacks a foundation in law or even credibility. <clears throat> At the prior planning board hearing on this matter, members of the board had very few questions for the planner, while the public had dozens of questions and comments. It appears that the planning board itself does not have proper guidance and that they are even being told not to concern themselves with tax subsidies. If the planning board members vote yes tomorrow, it will be a misuse of the well-intentioned law meant to cure blighted areas and will open up tax abatements to property owners. They, these are lower taxes that would not be offered to the rest of the community. I also want to mention the time and effort this ill-advised proposal is eating up of good citizens in researching and publicizing to the community what we can all plainly see, that the properties are dated and nothing more. I also want to share that it's gaining bad publicity among the taxpayers that West Orange has so many properties that are trying to be declared areas in need of redevelopment that are not blighted, but of course the implication is they might be blighted, but they're really not. It's very confusing. It's instigating irritation about our taxes and keeping us from attending to the positive things we want to do in our town and the good publicity we want to achieve. So it will be up to this body, it will be up to you to stop it. And I would like you to stop it as soon as you are able. I think it would be great if all of you came to the planning board meeting tomorrow so you can experience what the public has to experience and having to defend against this obvious tax subsidy plan for big business. And the only reason to declare these properties as an area in need of redevelopment is to open up tax subsidies. There's no other reason for it. And I think we have to keep reminding ourselves of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Malanga. Mr. Malanga, is there anyone else who'd like to speak uh, public comment? Please raise your hand and be recognized. Gotcha, after Mr. Dan, Dr. Dan. Kevin Malanga, Ridge Road. Council President, may I distribute a New Jersey Supreme Court decision to the members of the council? You're more than welcome to, yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. 
Madam Clerk, could you just stop the clock Thank while we examine these, sure. please? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the council, council president. Thank you for your service here as council president. It's been an outstanding year and we are very grateful and congratulations to Councilwoman McCartney. Uh, we look forward to working with you over the next Thank year you. as well. At the last council meeting, I made public comment with respect to the proposal that the Essex Green and Essex Executive Drive areas be uh, declared areas in need of redevelopment. And I was opposed to that designation. And I indicated that it's because the areas are not blighted. And Councilwoman McCartney took exception to my use of the word blight, which is why I've, I've provided this Supreme Court decision to the council in which the word blight is used 266 times. And this Supreme Court decision affirms the idea that areas in need of redevelopment are blighted. You can use the term interchangeably. And the only reason why the term blight is not used more than once within the statute is because blight was considered a pejorative. It had certain connotations that the legislature was seeking to avoid. So the terminology has been changed. Nevertheless, the criteria for determining an area in need of redevelopment, they all remain the same as when this was called the, the Blighted Areas Act. So I think that should the proposals move from the planning board to the council, you have to consider, members of the council, whether you view Essex Green and Executive Drive as blighted. Don't be deceived by the nomenclature. Simply because we're calling it areas in need of redevelopment doesn't mean that there are areas in need of a facelift or that there are areas in need of a paint job or areas in need of an updating or areas in need of a Starbucks. It's really blight. You're looking at whether there's broken windows, whether there's gang activity, whether there's a, a likelihood that this blighted area is hurting the community in terms of safety. I urge you to read this case. I've highlighted certain sections of it. And you can see that the Supreme Court is clear, mentioning it 260 times, the word blight. That's what you have to find in order to declare an area in need of redevelopment. And one final request that I have is we've heard many updates on the schedule of the downtown redevelopment project. Could we get a schedule in writing? I've yet to be involved in a construction project and I have been involved in many of them where there hasn't been a written schedule, a critical path method, a percentage of completion schedule, all of this should be provided to the township council and in turn provided to the public so we can truly see where we stand. We need to know exactly what's taking place. And it's nice to be told it's moving along positively that things are going to be rented out in April. That's great, but let's see a schedule. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malanga. Dr. Daniel, is there anyone else who'd like to speak uh, public comment? Please raise your hand. Mr. Bugalisa, it looks like you're on deck. Dr. Daniel. Hi, um, my name is um, Robert Daniel and I'm from 2B Buckingham Road. So first of all, this is a milestone meeting. We're closing out 2017, soon uh, 2018 is upon us. Thank you for this opportunity again to express my thoughts on multiple issues. Um, again, I am deeply distressed that our town council approved a process that will ultimately lead probably, possibly, to granting of tax abatements towards the redevelopment of the most highly valuable property in our township, Essex Green Shopping Mall and the Executive Drive office building. So those back in September, that was a poorly informed decision. Hopefully you folks will have time. If you've heard us, you've heard what's going on at the planning board and those cannot be followed by more bad decisions. 
If there is a problem with public works in animal control downtown that's in the footprint of phase two, then let's figure out a solution either taking, taking that property out of phase two or find some other property. The solution should not be driving what's happening at Essex Green and Executive Drive. Um, nonetheless, we as under, people here in this room, we understand that there is going to be redevelopment at Essex Green and that it will be happening by the new owners. Clarion and what I understand is Leg Mason, who owns Clarion, um, they can and should provide, they should proceed without any support from us taxpayers. They don't need any rebates or pilots or anything from us. And as our representatives, I hope that you're aware of the fundamental inequity of tax abated properties. To the rest of us folks here in West Orange, who a few of us are sitting here in the audience today. And um, I just want to follow up on what Rosary tried to read to you. It's really important that you read what the former Controller General of our state, Matthew Boxer, wrote. He wrote a really important report about tax abated properties in the state. It's really important that each one of you read as, we, as our township moves forward in this process. And that's what Rosary, and I think we'll probably be sending that out to all of you to make sure that you get it. Um, second issue, we appear um, now shifting. We're done with Essex Green. Uh, we appear to have a lack, and this is administration, Mr. Sayers, uh, a lack of effective control on our zoning, building, and enforcement department at the far western corner of our township. I'm specifically talking about Laurel and Eagle Rock Avenue. Um, their permits are being issued and um, occupancy is happening in a particular home there without regard for con the conditions that, are being, that have, were set forth by the zoning board and the planning board. More about this in the future, not within my two minutes that, left, that are left. Topic number three, there is a PNC bank on Northfield Avenue that managed to do a complete sidewalk, parking lot, reconstruction without a permit, without any regard for all of the policies that were set, policies, resolutions, and procedures of our township. Everything that's written, they just flew under the radar until one of our citizens here became aware and alerted the um, authorities that, in fact, this was going on. The ordinance number 20-30.1 of our township, everybody who can take notes, says that every property owner is supposed to have sidewalks on their property. Somehow PNC Bank out of Pittsburgh managed to fly under the radar. Um, and topic number four, closing out, um, just an FYI, the Foresters contract, from what I understand, will be ending it on December 31st. Uh, he works for us, from what I could gather, one day a week for a few hours. Um, we strongly urge that this contract be renewed in 2018 on a month-to-month -month basis. I assume this will be coming up in a future, probably in January, when Susan is running the council, that that only be renewed in the Mr. Sayers, I'm talking to you, you know, how this is brought to the council on a month-to-month -month basis, not on an annual contract, and that our township possibly explore a alternative source for these services, perhaps a joint services agreement with a neighboring town or city that has the t same type of forester, perhaps um, South Orange, Maplewood, Orange, or Livingston, and we could share the services of a forester who would be available five days a week, but on an hourly basis as needed. So I just wanted to thank you for your time and wish you a good new year and a uh, good holiday season, and thank you for your listening and your patience with 19 seconds left. <laughs> Perhaps you're imagining sitting up here one day. Oh, another one. <laughs> oh, certainly. Certainly. You can, you can come after. That's, that's fine. Mr. Dorf. Yeah, after. After. He's already up here. If you're okay with that, Mr. Puglisi. I'll be very brief, so. Okay. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Go ahead, I'm sorry. So Anthony Puglisi, uh, representing County Executive Joe DiVincenzo. Um, just want to uh, remind everyone this holiday season uh, with the Holly Lake Spectacular at Turtleback Zoo, uh, we do encourage you to bring a non-perishable food item, uh, gently worn winter coat or a new toy uh, that will be donated to organizations that help uh, less fortunate people. Uh, and then also uh, this month it also is our gingerbread contest at the Environmental Center. Uh, that runs until December 15th. 
Uh, so if you have an opportunity, um, I always get hungry when I see those houses, <laughs> but you know, you got to look and not touch. So, uh, but I invite you to come out and uh, see that as well. Uh, and then if you visit our website at EssexCountyNJ.org, there's a, a whole lot of other events and activities that are going on. Uh, I just also want to congratulate uh, Council President Kokoviak on uh, 2017 and uh, wish good luck to Councilwoman uh, McCartney on 2018. Thank you. Before he leaves, thank may you. I ask him a question before he Certainly. leaves? Okay, Certainly. Okay, thank you. And while you're here, um, that there was a comment, Rosary Morelli just made a comment about a county newsletter. That is not something that we see regularly. Is that something that you can provide to us or send to us? I believe that's the, the Essex Advisor. Um, I know that's distributed through our senior services office. Uh, we just have to find out how they distribute that. Okay. Could you put us on that list so that we sure. can get it here? Okay. Mm -hmm. Just a comment about the uh, gingerbread houses. What's interesting about that is that they have to be, they have to have at right. least five or seven sustainable features right. built into the structure of their house. So very, very creative yes. exhibit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Wiglisi. Mr. Dorf. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Please raise your hand. We're getting to the end, so speak or forever hold your peace until the next uh, Council meeting in January. My name is Lewis Dorf. I live at 4 Hepworth Court in West Orange. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, oh, clarify. I just wanted to try to educate some of the people here who have made inquiries about the absence or the need for a marketing document relative to, uh, I know they were asking about a marketing document relative to the retail space and commercial space at uh, at the Edison Village, uh, but people are also obviously interested in the uh, marketing status of Essex Green. And I just wanted to make uh, what I think is an important point. Uh, there's a company called Ripco uh, Real Estate. Uh, Ripco is a very large and successful, uh, predominantly retail uh, broker, retail space broker. Uh, with uh, office, with uh, a large presence in New Jersey as well as in New York and the other and other areas of the tri-state region, and uh, in the uh, marketing document which exists online, which can be easily accessed by going to ripconj.com, uh, there is a uh, there's an entire area that discusses the under under uh, new developments or under development, uh, under the development heading for the Essex Green development with a large uh, uh, hy hypothetical rending, rendering, uh, artist rendering, showing uh, what the potential Essex Green redesign could look like. I realize this is completely hypothetical, but there, just be aware that this document has been available to the public and to real estate brokers who are involved in bringing prospective tenants to uh, RIPCO and obviously uh, specifically to inhabit ultimately uh, the vacant space, some of the vacant space at Essex Green. And there's a large red banner uh, across the left-hand corner, upper left-hand corner, of this uh, of this large rendering that says under new ownership planned redevelopment. So my question is just that if this document has been out and available to uh, the people in the professional real estate community, which I'm part of, and to the general public, and to obviously people who are involved with the municipalities that host these uh, developments, and you are, you are obviously the people that are involved in making these decisions along with the, the planning board, how is it that there is a published document uh, that's at least six months old, published by the exclusive leasing agents for Clarion and uh, I guess Leg Mason, if Leg Mason in fact is the parent or co-funder of uh, the Essex Green project. How is it that six months ago, there's a do document that exists online that says 
new new redevelopment that you know that says redevelopment when everybody in this room for weeks on end has been asking the questions about why is redevelopment being proposed promoted why are we spending so much money on redevelopment when it's already showing as a essentially a fait accompli on this large, very expensive public access document. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Dorf. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak uh, at public comment? Please raise your hand. Uh, seeing no hands, I'm going to close public comment and ask any of my colleagues if they'd like to respond. I can respond. Councilwoman. Just um, going down the list, starting with Rosary Murley, just to commend her for her advocacy on the aging in place. Um, and you introduced us to Matthew Boxer. I, I know I have so many documents that I've saved um, from him, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, and I guess it goes along um, that I would dis respectfully disagree with the 2010 uh, document that you did present. Um, because so many other municipalities in the state of New Jersey have undergone that, not just the municipalities that you mentioned, or the cities that you mentioned in there. Um, Mrs. Mal Sally Malanga asked about why the planning board didn't ask any questions. Um, we did not discuss. We heard the presentation and discussions and deliberations are being carried till tomorrow, so that's why no questions, we ran out of time, and that's why questions are, deliberation is is tomorrow evening. Um, Kevin, I guess I did take offense to the blight. I don't know that I took offense to it, but I know I was quoted in paper as saying that blight was not mentioned in this report, and, and it's not, because what our introduction says is that under the regulation of the local redevelopment and housing law, state statute, delineated area may be determined in area need to in need of redevelopment if, after investigation, notice and hearing as provided in Section 8 of the Public Law, governing body of the municipality by resolution concludes that within the delineated area, any of these eight provisions could meet the criteria to designate a property in need of redevelopment. Blighted would be the most obvious, but that's not in this Public Law uh, 1992. And what we did here in our presentation in November on November 1st was that the criteria that was listed in this document that that particular site met uh, the criteria in provision B and D, the discontinuance of use of the buildings and areas with buildings improvements um, with an obsolete layout kind of leads me into what um, Lewis was talking about with this hypothetical sketch that's out there. Um, it is hypothetical. I don't know why it's listed as an area need of redevelopment. I can't, add, or, or even just redevelopment, um, I can't answer that question, but does it even talk about zoning? Because there are only two zones up there right now, PC, which is for planned commercial, and OB for office use. Um, so, you know, really if this, what the planning board is looking to do is just give an overlay on this to see what the marketing trends are, what would move up there, what could improve the site. That's what we're looking at. Um, comments were made about financial. That is not discussed as everyone heard at the planning board meeting, the chairman. We really just discussed municipal land use. We don't discuss any of the implications of um, the financial structures. Um, I, I did want to mention, though, that I was at a meeting this morning with Governor Cody and his staff, um, Senator uh, J.C., and a conversation came up about uh, pilot programs and tax incentives, and we did hear that Jersey City um, just adopted an ordinance on the structure of their pilots and what should be included in that, if we should go in that direction. Um, I did ask the clerk to see if she can get a hand on, uh, on that ordinance. Um, we haven't been able to find it yet, but we'll track it down just to see. But in no way would we ever shortchange the taxpayer. We, we just wouldn't. So 
I'm sorry that this has spun. Um, we'll see tomorrow after the discussion and deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody else? Councilwoman. So uh, that's why I voted for uh, Councilman McCartney to be on the <laughs> planning board. <laughs> now, seriously, though, um, I, I did attend the last, last meeting and uh, listened to Mr. Greigel's presentation. And he did have that debate with you, uh, Mr. Malenka, in regards to blight it because of the new interpretations of the law. I look forward to going tomorrow night and hear more of the comments. Um, but um, again, we're not we're not there yet. We're taking baby steps. I, I hear hear you, hear all of you, and thank you for coming down tonight. Um, I have to tell you, um, I have um, <clears throat> past week or two. Well, not I, I was away for a little bit, but I uh, I've been a lot of uh, commercial real estate closings up in Hackensack. I'm a I'm a title closer for a title company and having various conversations on redevelopment, especially in that area, Main Street and Hackensack is, is really getting developed up in Teaneck, um, a lot of Bergen County. Uh, read a long article, talked to a few people from the League of Municipalities, and yeah, it's, it's a real estate tool. I mean, plain and simple. You know, you, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It's, it's a real estate tool. So um, I guess the approach I'm having is I'm gonna see where the planning board goes with this. But, you know, I have to see what the benefit is to the town and if it will be harmful to the town. Uh, I know um, one thing we haven't talked about, I know folks are concerned about tax abatements, but, you know, we lost, um, we, we lost tax appeals to those properties. And so, you know, the property isn't as lucrative as it once was. Uh, and again, it's just the trend. It's nothing anybody's doing or there isn't this big conspiracy. But uh, unfortunately, the office complexes that is the trend. You know, they're they're emptying out uh, up in um, Roseland. There was a big firm. Uh, the building is empty. It's it's just the trend. Folks are going back to Newark, Jersey City, all those towns that are were just mentioned by Miss uh, Morali, taking whatever advantage or whatever they may be, or just u utilizing the tool. But we have to be careful. We have to look at the numbers, which haven't been presented to us yet. And, you know, so we just, you know, we have to rely on Mr. Gross to do the math for us and the administration and see where the planning board goes and um, take it from there. But it's, it's only if it's a benefit to the township that I would be supportive of it. But it is a real estate tool that is out there, not just West Orange, but to many municipalities in, in the state of New Jersey. You know, um, the developers, there was a conversation when the last meeting, so I'm not was here, or the planning board meeting, about, you know, this is why they come. Well, yeah, this is why they come and develop in our township. They know we're good partners with redevelopment. And, you know, that could also be a good thing. It doesn't have to be a negative. It could be a good. So we, let's see what the benefit is. If it's, if it's a benefit, it's a benefit. If, it, if it's not, then, you know, that's another discussion. But um, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow night, I'll be listening, and um, we'll see what Mr. Greigel and the planning board uh, has in store for us tomorrow night. But I just, just, you know, beware. It's not that it's blighted properties. It's properties in, in need and obsolete. So, yes. <laughs> okay. um, as far as Ms. Morelli, before, um, you know, thank you for what you're thank doing you. and congratulations again on your position. We look forward. I know when the survey comes back, communication, I won't be surprised if that's a big part of what we need to get out there with information. Uh, I've been talking to even our PR commission to see what we could do to get some information out there uh, in regards to programming. And Mr. Puglis. Uh, Cigano. Oh, there he is back there. I look forward to all the holiday celebration that the county provides. You know, we've done a lot in the township here, but it's nice to be complimented with all the activities. And for folks, if you get your card from the county in the mail, try to go out to some of their, um, some, to the zoo or to the historic sites that they have. It's, it really is delightful this time of year. And Council President, I get a chance to mention Mr. Feigowitz, it's gone, but I did want to give him kudos. Um, for a year, he served as an architect for the school district, 
and I had the pleasure of working with him on many occasions. He has designed Liberty Middle School, and he just uh, joked to me maybe in 50 years or so, uh, it, it could uh, be a historic <laughs> landmark down the road. But seriously, I uh, even noted on, on the tour, uh, we're very lucky here in, in the uh, township to have schools with such rich historic uh, and architectural uh, design. And uh, thanks to his work through the years, he really helped to preserve, helped the school district to preserve the integrity of those buildings. So again, uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow night at the planning board and, and just getting the information that we'll need from the administration to make a, a valid decision if it comes our way. Council President. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Cerullo, I think you had your hand up next. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I first want to start off with the PNC question. Uh, do we know any details about that, a PNC bank, and whether or not they bypassed the permitting process? Uh, no, I do not. I will check that tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. If it's a, if it's a re, I mean, I, I, if it's a rehab of an existing structure, and that is not really affecting electrical lines or plumbing, you may not need a plumbing. I'm sorry, you may not need a permit. Again, I'm a little bit behind. You're working too hard, Councilman. Yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but if it's, uh, you know, but if uh, some of the utilities were affected, I'm, I'm sure that a permit was necessary. So I would uh, like to uh, hear about what happened there. Uh, uh, as it relates to the redevelopment, um, uh, uh, Dr. Daniel, um, I don't, I, I, I disagree with the the the, uh, the point about the on not being uh, that the fact that we voted on uh, pursuing a uh, study as being a uh, not a necessity. Uh, I believe in municipalities being proactive in assuring that. Uh, I, I believe you're a, a, a planner, urban planner. Uh, I believe in municipalities being proactive in assuring that uh, market conditions, housing conditions, uh, don't deteriorate to the point that they affect uh, the entire municipality as a whole. So um, the, the council at that time, at least in my, my estimation, uh, did not make any commitments to any uh, tax abatements, uh, any uh, designation, but rather just uh, uh, gave the green light to assess. <coughs> Uh, which is uh, where we are right now. Uh, we ha uh, the planning board uh, has before them uh, this initial assessment. Uh, they'll be voting on that assessment uh, tomorrow uh, on whether or not the, uh, the, the, the office park in the commercial complex meets that designation under the law. Now, those designations exist uh, for the purposes of assuring that uh, municipalities have a tool to safeguard against uh, uh, blighted areas, if, you know, for lack of a better term, or con uh, 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 condi certain conditions that, that make it sure that they do not affect the municipality as a whole. So where we are right now is we are assessing whether or not those partials in that area uh, <coughs> can potentially impact uh, the uh, municipality as a whole. I'm a taxpayer, I live right down the street. Uh, some, some, some of you guys live down the street, others live uh, the other side, but should um, deteriorating conditions be allowed to, to, to move forward, uh, it can have a potential impact. Now, the question on whether or not it meets those uh, criteria, that, that criteria under the law, uh, it's going, is going to be assessed tomorrow and eventually uh, it, it will come to the town council. Now, if approved tomorrow and it comes before the town council, we need to assure that um, that those findings uh, really have some solid uh, factual uh, proof uh, behind them uh, before we really make a determination, as opposed to just uh, saying that, uh, hey, you know, because of the, you know, the, the walkways or the geography or, you know, we have to make, we have to assure that um, whatever a great, whatever decision is made is really backed by uh, some, some facts, some solid facts. Because personally, personally, I have a suspicion that market conditions may have some, uh, like uh, glo global and national trends may have something to do with the condition of, the, of, of that area. Uh, the office parks are becoming obsolete. Office parks were big in the 70s and early 80s. Um, 
as it relates to the, the mall concept, uh, that is also becoming obsolete because of online shopping. Uh, so uh, we are at a point where, like, I guess as a municipality, we, may, we are uh, assessing whether or not uh, that trend that will continue uh, can be detrimental to our municipality, and we have to be proactive. Uh, and I think we are being proactive in, 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 in um, considering the tools that exist. So to summarize, what I'm saying is uh, there is validity to us um, doing that assessment, whether or not it meets that criteria, we have to carefully, carefully watch that. Uh, keep in mind also that on a global and on a national scale, office parks and commercial, uh, commercial establishments such as malls are going by the wayside. The markets are changing out there. So we have to decide whether or not, you know, uh, as a council, <coughs> as a municipality, we are willing to exercise that tool. The tool, the, the tool of the, 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 the tool of area in need of redevelopment can be used to rezone and can also be used for uh, 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 the extension of tax abatements if we feel that the necessity is there uh, as a whole for the municipality. Uh, that, those decisions haven't been made. So I just ask that you know, we all take a step back, allow the process to take its course, but when it comes here, just keep that in mind. Keep market conditions in mind and also keep, uh, uh, keep in mind that um, you know, we have to carefully safeguard uh, the treasury. Uh, it can have um, potential uh, financial impacts, loss of, uh, of commercial rateables. Uh, and, uh, instead, we would have a set formula. Uh, and uh, going back to that Matt Boxer uh, issue, and, and, and Ms. Morelli has brought this up before, going back to that Matt Boxer study, um, what, what's ironic is that the municipalities that she mentioned uh, there are municipalities that were considered uh, at one point Abbott school districts, right? And Abbott school districts are substantially uh, funded on, on, uh, with respect to education, substantially funded by the state of New Jersey, uh, uh, which means us, okay? So if you go to a, 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 an Asbury Park, you go to a Jersey City, you go to a Hoboken, you know, perhaps um, the, uh, the, this tool of uh, 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 redevelopment tool and these um, tax abatements were um, uh, overly used and possibly misused because, look, we're paying for the school system, right? And under that tool, under, under uh, tax abatements, the tax abatement law doesn't require us to pay for the schools. So if you go to an urban area that's, that's an avid school district, it's an advantage for them to overly exercise that tool because we're paying for the schools and all those extra children that come in as a result of development. So I don't, the, my point is I don't disagree with you that, uh, that the, um, that report is accurate, but we have to keep in mind that the municipalities that you mentioned and the areas where there was, uh, uh, there is uh, um, possibly elements of abuse are all urban areas, okay? Uh, not suburban areas. Uh, we're a little bit more careful because we have to pay. For, we're paying a, a large portion of you know for education. So when That's you right. ask how many students is, is this is this creating, uh, it, it's an important element. In Hoboken, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. In Jersey City, you don't have to worry about that because we're paying for those extra children. Okay. So um, make sure we we have to make sure that we understand that distinction. You know, urban versus suburban with respect to the use the use the using of. Of, of, of tax abatements, um, and uh, and uh, we we'll look forward to, uh, to to the discussion, and we'll see what happens tomorrow. And when if it comes back here, we have to make sure that we have facts, solid facts, so that we can make a decision whether or not this is a tool that we're willing to exercise. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council President. Um, I'd like to you know concur with my colleagues on the Council, and not to go retrench what was just said. The one thing is, with over 35 years that I've had in financial retail development and development of the locations, the thing about it is it's all being repositioned. You know, think this word, folks, WeWorks. Think the word WeWorks, okay? A lot of office buildings, even what Councilman Cerullo said, are falling by the wayside because companies do not need large office complexes any longer. Think WeWorks. WeWorks just spent a billion three on the Lord and Taylor building on Fifth Avenue, which will now become WeWorks and WeWorks Kindergarten. Think about that. So that's how we have to watch, and that's our responsibility on the, on the council. 
and I will be at the planning board meeting tomorrow, and we have to wait and see what's given back to the council, but I can assure you, we will look, I will look at it in the total financial thing, not to affect in a negative way the township of West Orange. As Councilman Cervillo talked about, the Abbott districts, Hoboken is an Abbott district, which is ironic, because they got the highest property values. Okay, do they need to be an Abbott district? No. Okay, but who pays for it? The residents of the township of West Orange. Now, I constantly hear about people, oh, development, all the kids are going to come into West Orange. Well, guess what, folks? And I've said it for years, and when I was first elected to the township council. At this past Halloween, down at Roosevelt Middle School, where they have their annual neighborhood Halloween party, there were 250 kids I never saw before. And you know where they came from? Not from new development, not from the Edison complex, which you can't right now, but it came from all the house sales that have been going on in the township of West Orange, and these are all new families moving into the township of West Orange. So don't come to me and say, oh, development and the school population. No, it's happening. It's happening in a natural course. Council President, okay, so, all right, that's happening in a natural course. Now, I'm not gonna go on repeating what my colleagues have said. We'll wait and see what the planning board has to say. But I assure you that I will look at this on a financial basis and what I've done and understand that it won't negatively, negatively impact the township and the taxpayers of the township with Sarge. But we have, to look, we have to look forward. We have to think about what's going to happen five, ten years from now. How it will impact the commercial base, how it's going to affect the taxpayers. That, and that's all I'm going to say on, on that portion. Now, I heard tonight about our forester and month-to-month -month contracts and looking at other towns and their foresters. Well, that's fine. But I'm waiting to see the new, you know, tree ordinance proposal. Okay, it's been a couple of months. I'd like to see it. I see a red line. What do you think? I, I value, especially Sally, I value your opinions and your scope and concept. So I, as long, I think my colleagues in the administration would like to see your proposal to make the tree ordinance an even better ordinance to protect our forestry and to protect our environment. So that's what I'd like to see. And I'm sure it'll be a, a great document, but you know, enough of people, you know, saying, not saying you Sal, and saying is, but you know, about our forestry and everything else, let's get the document in place so we can use that as a stepping stone to make it even better. And whoever is the forester, give them a good tool to show what we need to do. And, that, and that's what I'd like to see. So uh, thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, just very quickly, I appreciate everybody who came up and spoke uh, tonight. Uh, I want to look into more about what's going on with the PNC Bank. Uh, obviously, there's two, maybe three PNC branches here in West Orange. So I just want to clarify which one. And so maybe at the next council meeting, uh, we can have that information. I know Mr. Mr. Sayers has left, but OK. Okay. Um, also, uh, Mr. Malanga, I think you make a very good point about uh, the, the schedule for downtown redevelopment. Uh, we actually, I actually have a copy of it, but I got to tell you, it's it's too small for my my eyes. So I'll uh, I'll work with the administration. We'll get get a legible copy and and get it circulated. So thank you for asking for that. Um, and then about the sort of the current redevelopment. First of all, Ms. Malanga, uh, I know you mentioned that the resources of residents are being, I don't think this was your word, taxed, but they are being strained uh, by pulling together all this information and making it public. I just want to say thank you. It is not, that your efforts are not going unnoticed. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information that's flying around now that I think is going to contribute to, uh, to this discussion. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who, uh, who's doing that. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Malanga, thank you very much for this uh, court opinion. I, I certainly want to read it. Um, the, the law, as, as you pointed out and as uh, Councilman pointed out, the actual redevelopment law now uh, barely mentions blight, doesn't even define it. So uh, this will be uh, very helpful uh, to us, I believe. Um, uh, I, Ms. Malanga, thank you for very much for bringing up uh, the Comptroller Boxer's report, it's uh, uh, back in 2010, it's floating around the internet, um, but it's a very good, it's a very in-depth, detailed look at uh, both the practice and the uh, legal structure of redevelopment. Uh, 
uh, both what the law allows and doesn't allow and also uses a lot of specific examples of, rede of redevelopment projects. And it, and it certainly is highly critical, but it, 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 I would recommend uh, people to read that uh, just, again, to get more background on this. And I'll, I'll uh, find the link and, and put it up uh, so that people can, can uh, take a look at it. Uh, Mr. Dorf, thank you very much for bringing this up. I was not aware of this. So if you, couldn't, if, if you could, please send a link to that material that you mentioned to council at westorange.org because that would, uh, that would be uh, very helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, just, just to sort of um, provide a little bit different perspective than my colleagues tonight, uh, one, the, issue, the, the, the primary issue of this whole debate is whether we as the council in West Orange should take advantage of the redevelopment law to provide tax subsidies that are in the redevelopment law that provide incentives to the private sector to invest in areas that the private sector won't do otherwise. <laughs> Let me just read you the law. At the start of the law it says, the legislator hereby finds, determines, and declares there exist, have existed, and persist in various communities of this state conditions of deterioration in housing, commercial and industrial installations, public services and facilities, and other physical components and supports of community life, and improper or lack of proper development, which result from forces which are amenable to correction and amelioration by concerted effort of responsible public bodies, and without this public effort are not likely to be corrected or ameliorated by private effort. So what that says to me is if the private sector is not doing its part in because the conditions of the specific property are just so bad, then the, pub, then the, the public sector has to become involved, provide the incentives, and that's where you get these tax abatements. You can have a tax abatement for up to 30 years. And the tax abatement comes in on the additional improvements that are made under the redevelopment law. But here's the situation that we have in West Orange from my perspective. The two major areas, Essex Green and Executive Drive, are not having trouble attracting private investment. Those two properties have recently traded at, uh, at a combined amount of over $100 million. So to my perspective, and I'm wait to be informed uh, when the issue comes back to the council, Looks like to me that the private sector is investing money in these properties. So I, I want to be sure that, that, that what we're talking about fits the facts like Councilman Cirillo was saying. The second area, the Eagle Rock Avenue area, actually uh, came before the planning board, I guess, uh, last year. Was it last year? I think it has been a year already. Yeah, yeah almost. It's two years ago. But, and, and this is the area around Prospect Avenue and Eagle Rock Avenue, which we all know is an area that has, is highly valuable commercial space and has continued to attract millions of dollars. We've had uh, CVS come in in the last couple of years after knocking down uh, Powell's Cabin, and I'm, I'm sure that, that, that work was in the millions of dollars. You've had somebody come and buy the property where the old Eagle Rock Diner is and is putting up a brand new larger building They've invested millions of dollars. So uh, again, I'm, what I'm seeing from 30,000 feet is that the private sector is investing and is ameliorating and correcting any sort of problems that are there. So what I'm trying to determine is, do we actually need to provide the incentives? Certainly the redevelopers, the developers think we need to provide the incentives because it just adds to their uh, profits. But what happens is we, as a township, basically take a whole lot less in what the tax revenues would be if there weren't the incentives. And on these major projects, we're talking about millions of dollars over 30 years. So that's what I'm trying to weigh, is that do we really want to 
give away a great deal of the tax revenues that would be coming to uh, us as a township. And when I say us, I'm talking about you guys because you, you guys pay the taxes and so yes. do we. Yeah. Uh, and to see whether that I is worth it. And um, so I encourage people to, to, to get more educated on this and to, and to contribute their, uh, their voices, just like we saw tonight and at the previous council meeting, at the planning board meeting tomorrow, uh, because this is certainly going to come back to us because the planning board <laughs> conducts the study and then provides that study with a recommendation to the council. And it's the council that has to make the major decisions about whether to in, in my opinion, potentially open the Pandora's box by certifying a redevelopment area, because once you do that, then you open up the potential for incentives. So I appreciate everybody coming tonight. I know this meeting is running really long, so uh, unless, Mr. Sayers, you wanted to add anything to that? Okay. I do have a quick Council question woman. for administration. Maybe Mr. Gross knows off the top of his head, so you understand why we're even entertaining the study. Uh, how much in tax appeals, what was the total for the properties that we lost in appeals for the property up at Essex Green? Oh, I, I don't have that off the top of my head. I, um, in terms of the, uh, and from what I, I write, there's appeals that haven't been um, so, gone to court yet that are out it's on. over $4 million. So we last, so the, we talk about, you know, abate, abatements. We've, Over we've, 4 million yeah. in, in, the, in the assessed value. Yes, yeah. so this is why we have to do our due diligence. We already lost revenue from those properties. So I know everybody's thinking investors, investors, but we already lost revenue because of the trend, if nothing else. And this is over the past few years, even before they had uh, bought the properties. Thank you. And that's the kind of information we're going to need to make a valid decision on if it's a benefit to move forward. That's if the planning board moves forward. Maybe Council McCartney could just explain why the planning board doesn't utilize the figures that we will work with in regards to the appeals tomorrow night, just because I know that question is going to come up. Because the question was asked to you at the last planning board meeting. How come the planning board isn't taking into consideration the the abatements, uh, rather the abatement yeah. figures? The planning so. board deals strictly with municipal land use. The council has the authorization for financial any financial implications would not be addressed at the planning board meeting. So this way, folks know tomorrow night if that's an, a question again that they are coming to ask. It, it just won't not, get answered. Right, not at the planning. Councilman. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify the uh, issue of an area in need of re uh, rehabilitation. No, area in need of redevelopment. Two, two, sorry, mm -hmm. two totally different designations. Area in need of redevelopment. Isn't the tax abatement secondary? Just because you declare an area in need of redevelopment, it doesn't mean that you're extending a tax abatement, no. No. correct? It, it, it so is. it's very premature to yes, say that there are financial incentives being extended to this area, even if it's declared as an area in need of, right. of, of, of redevelopment? While, while it often follows that areas in redevelopment end up with some type of tax incentives uh, or other incentives, um, it is not preordained. And it is not always the case. It is often the case. That is true. Mm -hmm. And it is more prevalent than it is not. But the tricky, the tricky part of this, and it is tricky, is that the council has to decide, the council and the, the planning board has to decide the vision it has for a particular piece of property. And then the council has to decide whether or not that particular vision is attainable in a pure market environment. And if it is, then there's no need for an abatement or, or tax incentives. Um, and if it's not, and the council and the planning board and the community <laughs> want to move forward with that vision, then oftentimes it requires some type of an incentive. And that's the tricky part, is making that decision. And when I say tricky, and it's tricky in the sense that not everyone agrees on what the criteria is. Not everyone, not everyone may agree on what the vision is or the importance of the vision. And that's where it, it that's where you can get tangled up. Um, you know, I've, I've I've done I've been involved in a lot of redevelopment projects. Some of them have not had um, uh, tax abatements. Tax abatements, even though they were in a redevelopment zone. Sure. 
uh, and some, and the vast majority did. Um, but the ones that didn't get it was because the economics of the deal didn't didn't allow it, and therefore it wasn't in the taxpayer's interest to to award it. Um, so it, it does happen, and, it, and it, it's it happens more in mature development areas than than non mature development areas, but it does happen. I see. So uh, my next question, if I may, Council please. President. With that clarification, so what can happen? Can the council approve an area in need of redevelopment, but not a tax incentive at the beginning and later on consider a tax incentive? Well, that's uh, in fact, what, that's in fact what happens. Or two different there, there, that's in fact what happens. Right, because it's two yeah. different pieces of policy. Yes. Okay, so my second question, John, and I appreciate the, the, the clarifications. In the absence of a tax incentive, what are the incentives to uh, uh, a redeveloper or a uh, business, um, a commercial owner? Oh, well, but there's other things. Uh, uh, you know, bulk, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the bulk zoning. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things that that, that are uh, are within the power Low of the municipality, uh, depending on the circumstances. I mean, the, and the municipal, and, and frankly, the municipality has more power. For instance. Uh, where, whereas you probably can't enforce design standards on, on properties that are not in a redevelopment zone in, in most circumstances, in a redevelopment zone you can always enforce design standards. So the municipality has a lot of power too. And so again, the, when, 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 it, when it comes before you, there's a lot of considerations. You know, obviously, you no, no one likes the idea of of, of giving tax incentives or, or financial incentives to someone um, to just to build a project. And, and so the, the standard has to be, but for the incentive, the project would not be built. And it is a priority of the governing body and the community that the project be built. Those are the two things you have to put together, in my opinion. Thank you for that. Thank you for the time, Council President. Anyone else? No, it seems like that's what you just read, Council President, in that uh, in that statement that you made. Hmm. It looks like we're done, mm -hmm. Madam Clerk. Okay, we're going to review the consent agenda, approval of minutes of previous meeting, public meeting, and executive session minutes of November twenty-first, two thousand seventeen. Abstain. Consent. consent. Report of township. I, I wasn't here. Township. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> just just want to note this. <laughs> oh. Madam I, Clerk. I abstained. I'm sorry if you didn't hear me. Oh, okay. yeah, I was no, in your last not. meeting. I didn't hear you. Okay, thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Season's Good night. greetings. Good night. Um, report of township officers, none. Reading of petitions and communications and bids. Correspondence from Mayor Parisi reappointing the Honorable Dennis Dowd, effective January 1st, 2018, for a three year term ending December 30th, uh, 31st, 2020, and designate him as Chief Judge of the West Orange Municipal Court, effective January 1st, 2018. Consent. 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 Bills. Are there any questions on the bills? Consent. Consent. Resolutions. Are any resolutions being pulled this evening? Council President, I have a question. question on I have questions on C and F, and I don't know if you'd like to read the priority list that was given to us today on the on E on the community development block grant. Why don't we Why don't we look at the CDBG stuff now? Because that's something that we could reprior reprioritize if we wanted to. Yeah, I had a question on the one item. Let's just uh, uh, look at that first, start if you with wouldn't that. mind. So for those of you who are following at home, uh, we annually apply for community development block grants uh, that are managed through the county, and we have to provide them with a priority list of projects that we'd like to support with these grants if we get them. And Basically, it's a suggestion because what money we get depends on uh, how much money is out there and how much the county decides to give to us. 
Is that, and which projects they want to give to us. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much <laughs> without too simplifying. So the, uh, so I just want to throw this out to my colleagues. If we thought, we have the list, if we thought that we wanted to change uh, the, the priority list at all, uh, we can do that now. Just to start things off, to my way of thinking, the first two, uh, the first two on the list, the Main Street Counseling Center, which always gets funding uh, yeah. annually, and the Bethany Center for Champions, which I think does a really good job uh, with a lot of youth here in town. Those are fine for me for the first two priorities. And then the other three are, uh, are street improvements for a lot more money. But just wondered if anybody else had any thoughts on that. What a question on the Bethany. Question on Bethany? Yeah, do, um, which, you know, they do wonderful work and I'm, I'm a big supporter of theirs. Uh, do they get an increase from last year? Are they buying something in particular or is that what we give them every year? No, I think this is less. Um, sure sorry, I think this is less than what, what I've seen in the past. Really? Yeah. I thought last year was 45. Mm, not for Bethany. It, it's usually a, a, a partial funding, and they don't ask for it every year. Yeah. I don't think they asked for it last year. Since I've been here, no, they, they were, were here last year. Last right. Year. Yeah, they were. The okay. They came back. I know if they were doing something special or, you know, extra, but no, they do phenomenal work. We've seen a, a great improvement in, uh, with, the, with the students and the, the kids. I so, Mr. Sayers, Mr. Gross, do you know what the, the what the money? Because I I understand that Bethany, all of these recipients have to make a proposal. Did, has anybody seen the? Uh, I, I don't Bethany? have the proposals in front of me. To be quite honest with you, Mr. Lepore reviews the proposals. Okay. Goes mm -hmm. over them with the mayor, and he sets a priority in okay. order. Um, but I can tell you that Bethany Church uh, definitely utilizes that money for very good things for the statue. Yeah, I just wonder what the what in they the were, past, what the projects have, were. They've always they've always done a good job, and that's why we we always work with them. Mm -hmm. I'll just I'll send an email to Mr. Lepore asking yeah, to send the council you, yeah, the, the, the application. Yeah, I could also talk to, you know, Reverend Zach. And so. One Reverend of the things Zach. they're always looking for is vehicles. They'd like to purchase or lease yeah, vehicles well, that's because I was just, I was they do a lot of traveling for their for their sports mm -hmm. athletic teams. Thank you. Anything else? Does anybody want to change the priorities? No, I'm, I, I'm okay with Mr. Lepore. I mean, street improvements is his thing, so. And we you will can't. never see 660. Uh, no. <laughs> right. no, you're That's not right. going to see that. No, we'll, be, we'll be fortunate if there's 400. a high two. Uh, sometimes so, but so we're done with CDBG because you oh, have well, no, I do want to make a comment just about uh, number three and four. That is, and you and I were both at the, um, again, area need of redevelopment on Central Avenue, and you saw yeah. the orange side, the walkthrough, and right. So we were there yeah. at through the walkthrough and just, um, you know, if we have that mirror image of what they did in Orange, I thought the building was magnificent. And as we toured, we saw the surrounding areas. So um, street improvements go hand in hand with what's already uh, being redeveloped there. So I would be in favor of seeing that happen, mm -hmm. street improvements on Tompkins and Stock Stockman. But you're good with the priority list as it is now? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else on this? Resolution 250-17. We no. don't have to vote on it. We can just put in a consent agenda. If sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Councilman, you had the floor because you had some other resolutions. Oh that yes. You, um, that you were asking I had about. A, well, just on Resolution 248-17. This would be for John. If um, this was the will Dan and the direct install, and here we were thrilled that we were getting such a yes, you know savings on what they're doing and now they see structurally again they need work to be done but I, it doesn't appear that that sig significantly reduces the amount that um, we expect it to save um, it extends the it's a, it's a higher amount we're getting more grant uh, it does expend it does extend the uh, time frame about 11 days to break even in theory oh. Okay. Um, it, so it, it's pretty much the same um, deal, except that the state basically came in and said, we won't fund the other unless you do the rest of this. Oh, replacement so it's, it's work. Either, it's, this is basically take it or leave it. Okay. So. That's okay. 
it was still a good deal. And Council President, also on Resolution F251-17, this was the uh, authorization to accept 19,000 square feet of space at Pleasant Valley Way at, you know, the uh, Pleasantdale Presbyterian Church. I, my question is that if that space has already been designated as a commuter lot or municipal parking for the municipality from the church, the church was tax exempt. If Chase has now purchased that, does it, it doesn't remain tax exempt. Are there, my question is, are there any conditions that go with the conveyance of this parking space, of these parking spaces? That's exactly why they're giving it to us, so they don't have to pay taxes on that property. We haven't had any discussions no, about right? that, but uh, there were discussions about keeping it for the commuters. And uh, part of the issue was that they said they would consider donating it to the township. As time went on, they decided that's what they wanted to do. And I agree with the councilman, it's probably because they don't want to pay taxes on mm -hmm. the property. And, they don't and, need it. And, and nor the maintenance yeah. for the use. And in right. fact, most likely, if they retained um, ownership of the land, um, they would probably win a tax appeal for that portion of it to be tax exempt. Anyway, if we were the exclusive, if we're using it, mm -hmm. okay. so it, it, it's probably it, obviously it's to clean up that question once and for all, as well as so they don't have to pay any of the maintenance or the liabilities that come along with it. Right. And if we're the only ones using it, it's it's certainly a reasonable. Request. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Any other? Uh, anybody want to pull yeah. anything? I don't want to pull, but I just have a question. On two fifty four seventeen, uh, the sunlight for stop loss coverage. So that that decrease, which was great, but did, we didn't change the deductible, did we? In order to get that. No, in decrease? fact, it's a better. It's a better. Our, our our threshold deductible is the same, but the top is lower. So. Okay. Our, our aggregate threshold is lower than, than, than lower than the uh, current company. So. Okay. And then on the uh, R Rx, so that decreased as well, which which is better for us, but that was less claims. Well, ultimately, you don't. Yeah, your insurance rates yeah. don't go down unless you have good claims experience. And uh, you know, we we've uh, done done reasonably well um, with with. Um, prescription claims o o over the past few years. Last year we had a pretty big bump, but overall, in general, in general we've done all right in the last three or four years. Uh, okay. This year we're going to have a decrease. It's even better. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. So, so you guys were might have been ch mixing the two healthcare related things. You were talking about 254, which is the stop loss coverage. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think, I think yeah. Mr. Yeah. I asked about the deduction. Yeah, I moved oh. over to the other. Yeah, he, <laughs> okay. he, he the benefit without me. Yeah, I didn't name the, the uh, resolution, but I, I referred to it as the <laughs> prescription plan. He speaks, Michelle. He understood. <laughs> <laughs> I follow the bounce. If, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I torture him enough during my uh, phone calls. He knows how to follow me. So I apologize to the public. If I could, I, Councilman, are you done? Oh, yes. Because I just yes, wanted to Council follow President, up on, on just the question about 254.17. Maybe you could give Mr. Gross a, a, a minute uh, elevator speech on what stop loss coverage is and wh why you're recommending uh, what you're recommending. Okay. Uh, stop loss coverage is, is, uh, comes into play because we are self insured. So we, we pay for our employees and retirees claims directly. Uh, that's a benefit for us because we cut out an administrative cost of the insurance company including pro their profits. Uh, we pay a third party administrator to process the claims, but we are at risk for the claims. And most of the time that's fine because on average, you know, we're going to have our, uh, you know, some people will use it more one year and other people will use it more the next. But then you get, you run across uh, a catastrophic situation, two or three, maybe four a year, uh, with, with our size of group, uh, where literally the sky's the limit um, as to what it might cost. And if you didn't have this type of coverage, which is basically reinsurance over the top, saying, okay, once a, any particular claim goes above 200000 this insurance kicks in. Uh, so, uh, or any person's claims 
go over 200,000 within the year this insurance kicks in. So this protects us from a catastrophic illness. We there, heard a recent story, this it's an incredible story, this uh, particular uh, business, I believe it was, um, was decided they were going to go without this because their, claim, they had, their claims experience was pretty predictable. And they ended up with a claim uh, with uh, a young lady who's had some rare disease and um, had to get, get her medication was four hundred thousand dollars a month. Oh, that's a insane. month per month. Per month. Oh, that's insane. So you know, you're, you're talking just on that one person in a group of five million dollars at all. And so the, mm. that company obviously has has issues. Bottom line to it is is that this particular. A policy is from a company different than we used last year. Uh, the the premium for the policy is, is better than what was quoted for us from our uh, from the the other vendor. Um, it's the, the the we we have a stop loss as well, a, ta a total loss. So we have an individual on an individual we can go over two uh, two hundred thousand, uh, and we have just nine and a half million approximately. Um, total. Of total of total claims, and if, go, if our total claims go over that, then they pay. Um, so it re really makes a lot of sense for us for us to do that. Um, they also have a, a I'll call it an interesting bell or whistle in it. That it's a thing called a laser charge, which basically you know insurance companies <coughs> can laser laser people out of the process. So, so that because they've had a bad uh, um, year last year, they won't reinsure them. They'll only say instead of 200,000, their their stop loss goes to 250 or 300. This particular policy, they won't be allowed to do that upon renewal. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, they, they have, same time they could they can up the premium up to 50% in, in in the future too. So there's some room in there for. So it, it's it's an interesting um, facet to this. It's good to have. It's not the driving force uh, behind it. Um, Driving force behind it is we're saving money on premium. We're, we're saving. We'll save money on the top end if we ever hit it. And, and uh, it's lowering the deductible, isn't it? I mean, it's it's lowering the uh, expected slow, slowing the expected top, claims. Lowering the top, the, the top, the, the maximum uh, <coughs> ag aggregate cost is less than. It's not lower than last year's, but it's less than last year's company gave us an upon it. So. So I was on the phone with uh, our consultant. Uh, uh, for about an hour and a half today, and I thought, and I could be confused because we talked about a lot of things, but I thought he said that there are no laser provisions in the proposed in That's the correct. proposal from Sunlight. That's correct. A laser is not a good thing. Yeah. Right. No, I understand. Right. right. And, and I think he was saying that there were three or four lasers in last year's plan. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's good for us because if we have that continued claims experience, and I don't know who the people are, you guys have a better idea, but if we have that same experience, that's going to be beneficial to us because... That, it, it definitely is, but it, it's, it doesn't give me as much comfort because they also have a 50%, they can go up 50% in premium. So, so it, it, it's, that, that could eat up some of that laser, but, but it's, a, it's, def, it's definitely a good provision to have because if you, if you ended up with a lot of catastrophic claims, that would, upon renewal, that would be a big problem. So if I could continue the questioning, can you relate that to agenda item uh, D, resolution 249.17, where we're having $1.3 million in, in emergency borrowing uh, specifically for the health care? So maybe you could just relate how, why stop loss hasn't saved us. Stop loss doesn't help you. Any, any set of claims where an individual member or their family is under 200000 so you know, this, is, this is just the number of claims of normal, regular, everyday, non-catastrophic claims that we're having. Uh, um, we may or may not use this 1.3 million. Part of the problem is, is it's December 5th and 6th, 6th. Um, 5th. 5th. And I got to get to the end of that. I have three more weeks of payments because we pay by the week. And in October, September, end of September, October, the beginning of November, we got hit very hard with like half a million dollar a week, half a million dollars a week with the claims, which is an outrageous amount and really blew us out of the water. Um, so my concern was always, well, what do we do? 
if that trend continued. Now it hasn't, it's healed off, but there's nothing to say in the next three weeks we don't end up with three $500,000 weeks. So I just need the cushion to, to deal with. I'm, I'm hoping that when we, when we uh, resume this meeting, uh, that, that I'll be able to report to you that we had to use very little of this, but uh, it's just a um, precautionary housekeeping. And I do not intend uh, on, on funding this. Uh, we have to pay it off next year. If, whatever we use, we have to, fund, we have to pay it off next year anyway. And I have sufficient funds internally to, um, to, to fund it. So we, we, will, we will not be going out to, to borrow on this. Okay. And as long as we're talking about health care, maybe you could do another minute elevator explanation on uh, agenda item B, resolution 247-17, relating to our prescription uh, benefit through Benicard for the proposed. Well, I'm sorry, which, which resolution? 247-17, agenda item B. Okay, yes. Okay. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. This is insurance. Just regular old insurance like everybody else has. Like we have it for our groups, for our employees, and for our retirees. Uh, we got a renewal, renewal uh, for uh, this for next year uh, at minus 1.5% of premium. Uh, it's a straight premium. We're not at risk of anything above and beyond our premium. Um, it's a um, company that uh, we've been now with, I think, four years. Uh, and, you know, we've had, a, a hind we, like say, we all like to say hindsight is 2020. And, and we've, we've been with, in, in situations we, we, that weren't good for us, for our employees, for the administration, and for our, our legal costs, and, and just a lot of things in the past. Um, we're, we're really happy with this company and uh, we feel very confident in the product that they're giving us. Uh, we're getting good penetration in terms of our employees being able to go to the pharmacies they want to go to and the, the drugs that, the, that, they're, that are on their formularies uh, seem to be working out much better than, than they have in the past with other carriers. So we're very happy with them. So our meeting has gone so long that my battery is done in the process of a slow death. So I don't have access to my notes. but. The, the prescription insurance is going to fix our costs at about $4.2 million. It's down slightly a point or two. Yeah, about a percentage point. point. Yeah. Okay. About a point, yeah. And uh, on the other, on the uh, stop loss, I don't have access to my, to the total uh, premium this year. But do you, do you have that handy? Just to give people a perspective of why we're spending time on this, because these are, these are, you yeah, know, healthcare I mean, costs is one of the it's top three. It's a little over six hundred thousand dollars, and we're saving fifty. So that you know, to give you. Okay. A, okay. Thank you. Rather than tie up, looking. Thank you. I'm sorry, I sort of interjected myself. Councilman, do you have anything else that you wanted to ask about? No, I was good. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Council President, one more comment, not a question, just a comment. Sure. Um, I know we're going to have a full presentation from the Downtown Alliance in our January meeting, but I do want to commend the Downtown Alliance Board presenting a proposed budget here with the, an amazing amount of content on our downtown and the continuous crowd drawing successful events that are happening again this year with all of that happening and even with a reduction in their um, projected projected SID assessments, um, they come in with the same same amount. So they did the same thing last year. I just commend the board for this proposed budget. As look a forward to the presentation. No, just looking forward to the presentation. Uh, what, what actually, they gave us a brief summary in, in today, and it's up on the oh, web, it's on the okay. website. They're gonna give us a much more detailed right. uh, breakdown yeah. of it, in what they did mm -hmm. this year and what they project next year. Does the, does the administration actually have that document, this sort of second, more detailed budget document? Because I'd like to get a we chance to look at it. Okay, okay, so I'll just send the executive director an email and just ask for it sooner rather than later, because I'd like to get it ahead of the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, well, mm -hmm. heck, we've got, we've got our council liaison. Perhaps you could get a hold of it and get it to us a few days ahead of Sorry, time. My notes. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so anything else on, uh, on the resolutions? Nope. Nobody wants to pull anything? No, we're not pulling anything. No. You sure? <laughs> Positive. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The consent agenda is implemented. 
We have ordinances on second and final reading. Ordinance 2532-17, an ordinance establishing Chapter 23, Section 5 of the Revised General Ordinances of the Township, Township of West Orange Skate Park. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? So moved. Second. second. Councilman, I'm um, sorry, Councilwoman Casalino? Yes. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Krakowiak? Yes. Uh, under state law, all ordinances that are heard on second reading, second and final reading, require a public hearing. I hereby open the public hearing. If you'd like to speak on this ordinance, please raise your hand, be recognized by the chair, come down to the lectern, and uh, you can speak. Is there anyone who'd like to wish, anyone who, now I'm working too long, <laughs> anyone who wishes to speak on ordinance 2532-17? Please raise your hand. Just in case you didn't hear me, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands, I close uh, the public hearing and open it up to my colleagues if anybody would like to speak. Councilwoman. Yeah, I just wanted to share with the counts, with my colleagues, um, I had asked Mr. Keough because when I went to the uh, opening of the skate park, the sign was on the back wall, which as a mom, I like to see all the rules when I first walk into the park. We explained we need to pass the ordinance and uh, yes, yeah, signs all ready to go and you could probably concur with this uh, for the front where you enter the park. That will tell you you need a helmet. Right. <laughs> so and the font is so small on that sign that's in the far. <laughs> yeah, so, um, any case, you know, um, they did a nice job on the park. Went to the opening, very nice. So that's all I have. Thank you, Council President. Yeah. For whatever cost, I think it's somewhere north of $190,000. It, it should be really nice. Yes, it should. Uh, any, any other comments? Madam Clerk. Is there a motion to adopt 2532-17? So moved. Second. Councilwoman Casalino? Yes. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilwoman McCourt? Yes. Council President Krakowiak? Yes. Motion carries. Ordinance, and the ordinance carries. Okay. 2533-17, an ordinance amending and supplementing Chapter 7 traffic, subsection 7-32.2, Restricted parking zones of the revised general ordinances of the township, handicapped parking spaces, 82 Valley Way, and 24 Park Terrace. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? So moved. Second. Councilwoman Casalino? Yes. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilwoman McCarthy? Yes. Council President Krakowiak? Yes. Motion carries. Ordinance is approved. No, that was mm -hmm. on. Oh, that was that introduction. Was <laughs> <it. Yeah. laughs> this is what I mean. I've been doing this a year. And I've been working too hard with Councilman Cirillo, so I apologize. <sighs> Under state law, <laughs> all ordinances yes. on second and final reading require a public hearing. I therefore open the public hearing and ask anyone who would like to speak to please be recognized by the chair, come down to the lectern and make your comment. Is there anyone who'd like to speak? Please raise your hand. If there's anybody who'd like to speak, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands, I close public comment. It's public hearing. I can't get off this soon enough. I know that's what you're all thinking. <laughs> it, um, any of my colleagues like to uh, make a motion to uh, discuss? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Okay. Is there a motion to approve 2533-17? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Councilwoman Casalino. Yes. Councilman Cirillo. Yes. Councilman Garino. Yes. Councilwoman McCartney. Yes. Council President Krakow. Yes. Motion carries. Ordinance is approved. 2534-17, an ordinance amending and supplementing Chapter 7, Traffic, Subsection 7-29.1, Speed Limits in General, and Subsection 7-33, School Zones of the Revised General Ordinances of West Orange. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? So moved. Second. Second. Councilwoman Casalino? Yes. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Krokovia? Yes. Under state law, all ordinances heard on second and final reading require a public hearing. I'm opening the public hearing now. If you would like to speak on this, just this ordinance, please raise your hand, be recognized by the chair, and come down to the lectern. If anyone would like to speak on this during the public hearing, please raise your hand. 
Please raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Okay. Seeing no hands, I Make close the public hearing. Mm -hmm. Would anyone like to comment on this? I'm just saying, Council President, I'm very excited about this because it's adjusting and protecting our school children. And Could you just speak into the oh, microphone? Oh, sorry. You know this better. I know this better than I do. Okay. Uh, that I'm really excited about this, as I'm sure my colleagues are, with you know adjusting the speed limits, especially on Pleasant Valley Way and within the school zones, to move along our process of complete and safe streets. And I'm really happy, and I appreciate the Council's you know support of the continual improvement of our safe streets. Yes, and reducing the speed limit. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Right. Eventually, the signs are going to go up, so you've got to watch this guy. He's got to slow down in the mm -hmm. school zone. Mm -hmm. yeah, that that, that was the, my, my question. On the south end. Mm -hmm. the, sounds will be, the signs will be going up. We'll put it on the website, too. So, mm -hmm. well, not that sure. who, Who's going to really read the website? But. You can drive slower if you want. You don't have to wait to see the signs up. You can drive slower if you'd like. Nothing wrong with that. It's safer. Okay, any other comment? Nope. Madam Clerk? Is there a motion to approve 2534-17? So moved. Second. Councilwoman Castellino? Yes. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Zarino? Yes. Councilwoman Partney? Yes. Council President Kukoviak? Yes. Motion carries. Ordinance is approved. No ordinances on first reading. Pending matters, new matters, council discussion. I would like, oh, oh, go ahead. No, I do. Thank you. I would like to have an executive session put on um, our next January 9th meeting uh, to discuss the email that was just received on the Redwoods motion for intervention. Would that go on the new agenda or the recessed agenda? Right. Don't we usually have two different meetings on the first? Yes, we, 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 we have continue this one and then okay. we do the new one. So that was my question. We'll do this on the new one. So, Councilman, you, you might want to give some context to why you're requesting that. It's a matter of litigation, just to further explain what this intervention is. This is intervention in the uh, the proposed intervention into the affordable housing uh, situation here in West Orange. So we have uh, already have one intervener, the property owner on the property adjacent to West Essex Highlands, okay. and now this is okay. the second one who is also requesting to be included. Right. And essentially what's happening is the current state of the affordable housing law in the state is uh, adjudicating all of the uh, proposals for affordable housing through the local superior courts, and it's allowing developers to intervene and offer their proposed developments a portion of that uh, to help the town meet its affordable housing obligation and at the same time get what they're looking for in terms of non-affordable housing properties. So uh, Councilman McCartney and I have been at many meetings already on a proposed mediation on a settlement with the, the first intervener right. as well as the uh, state fair housing action uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of the name now because I'm so tired. Fair 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we haven't had a meeting in several months. I think we're waiting for the political dust to clear uh, and uh, one or two other of these adjudications that are going on in the state to see how those play out. But here's a second one and I think it's a great idea to have, uh, to have an executive session. Thanks. Good. So could you just check with Mr. Trank and see if there's any reason why we shouldn't? Is that it? I just wanted to throw out, I know this is my last meeting and I probably should have brought this up a long time ago, but we've actually briefly discussed this uh, at, at a couple of previous meetings and it's about potentially changing our public comment process to, uh, we've heard multiple times this year uh, people coming up and speaking and saying I'd like to engage in a dialogue with the council as opposed to the way we're doing it now. <laughs> Councilwoman <laughs> Castellina is, is giving herself whiplash again because she's really opposed to this. No. Yeah. But, no. uh, but, they, but they have wanted to, to have interaction as opposed to the way we're doing it now which is that they speak and then after everybody finishes speaking then we respond. And I just wanted to throw this out uh, 
with three, with, I'm sorry, with two conditions, two proposed conditions, that we allow people to have uh, a discussion if they want, keep them to the five minutes that they already have, so we won't be potentially extending their conversation any at all, at all, and make it, and the second condition is to make it uh, conditional. Like we try it for, I don't know, two or three meetings, see how it goes. If we like the way it goes, we can continue it. If not, it's fully within our power to change back to the way we do it now. Yeah. And I thought, given that we had, I, I thought, a pretty good experience this year, I know there was a couple of, couple of times where I thought that we were, that the speakers were less than civil, but out of the scores of speakers that came up, I thought it would be good. And it might just be something that we can try uh, the, pe the people who come up to speak would have the option. They can say, you know, and I think most people are going to say, I don't want to engage. I don't want to talk to you guys. I just want to tell you what my mm -hmm. problem is or what my comment is, and I'm going to say that and go sit down. But there probably are a few people a year who want to um, engage in a dialogue. We don't give them any extra time. And we can figure out how, you know, to be most efficient. But I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Councilwoman, but I, I think you were talking about how we used to do it. I think we did try that, and we found out that it was a long time past 10 o'clock when we went, um, <laughs> when we took that route. But, you know, with, I want to say respectfully that there are often times, though, we're telling people not to speak, and yet we're responding to them after yeah. the fact. Um, and there were, were many times that people did ask if they could say one more thing, and we did allow it. Right. So I, I, don't, I don't think we would change the protocol of that. I think five minutes gives us plenty of time. And, you know, we just had um, that really, really healthy discussion on Ludington. I think that took two or three council meetings to to discuss Ludington Terrace and, and everyone that came out um, on that. But we also received a lot of emails that we could respond to. Yeah. And I think that if, you know, maybe we put something here or Matt, you could put something on the tape that says Council at West Orange, if people want to send us notes, you know, we are all accessible. We have always been accessible um, to let them know that, you know, we can respond to any number of questions. Right. Madam Clerk, yeah. could you just I'm use, sorry. Yeah. I know you're, I know yeah. you're very modest, but yeah. please, I'm so if you sorry. want to chime in. Yeah, no, I'm just, <laughs> if, if the public wants to reach you, they, they would normally call my office and ask, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes they ask for your telephone numbers. I do not give them out, but I will <laughs> take their information yeah. and get you the message and, you know, um, and I know that you all will answer and you know, I've never had somebody call back and say, you know, well, he just didn't call me back or she didn't call me back or whatever. So I think that's probably the best idea because I think that five minutes is enough time and literally every single meeting we have somebody saying, oh, can, you know, can I just finish up my remarks? And, you know, every time I say your time is up, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like Did a joke. Get it, all <laughs> it just continues. So. I think it would just prolong, and I think if they want the opportunity to talk with you, they have that opportunity, and they will, you know, they can get in touch with you via email, telephone, writing a letter, you know, meeting with you. I mean, that happens. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you've met with people. I, I, so. I know I've been a little bit more lenient than uh, than than the five-minute cutoff, and I just feel a little obligation to let them finish their thought, but I. I I understand where you're coming from. My thought is that it is a unique opportunity for people to come at a council meeting and air a grievance or air a comment. It could be occasionally people compliment us. <laughs> uh, but it's an opportunity for, to do that in, in a public hearing and uh, videotaped, at least when it's not unplugged, like which happened <coughs> earlier today. And it just, it, it, particularly on an issue like redevelopment that is going to affect every taxpayer in town. It's a unique opportunity for them to come before this and if they, it, it's, up to the, it's up to the people who want to speak because my feeling is, you know, we work for them and they should be able to, they're our bosses, they should be able to, if they want to have a dialogue with us for five minutes, no longer than five minutes, and I, 
I know I've been a little bit lenient on that, but uh, uh, th that's that's my thought. That there's that this is a unique opportunity, and there there are some situations that the township might benefit or the residents might benefit from being able to watch it and and hear the interaction uh, here at the council meeting as opposed to going through email or, or individual phone calls. Councilman. So uh, you and I have debated this a, a couple times. So in my experience, uh, I know everybody's tired of hearing me say when I sat on the school board, but when I first got on there, uh, we had that open dialogue and it just, we were, it just went on and on. It, it's really hard to police. Um, I think we do a great job of getting everyone's question answered. I know that because sometimes administration says to us, do you have to answer every question? And, and, and not that we don't want to, but it prolongs the meeting. Um, it's, and I'm afraid that I get, I understand you want to try the five minute rule with having a conversation within five minutes, but then someone's going to say, well, I didn't get to really talk because you responded to me within the five minutes. Mm -hmm. I think you've been doing this a long time. Uh, I, it's hard for the people that are waiting to speak, that come to the meeting, that want to hear an answer. They get their questions out, they make their statements, they comment. Uh, we, on the other hand, I think we have taken the time when there isn't clarity with the speaker and we need to ask them. I, I don't mind us breaking that rule a bit, a little more, maybe one of us raise our hand and say, I didn't understand what the, you know, clarify the, you know, what they're trying to make the statement to us so we could properly respond. But um, I'm not speaking for myself. I know the rest of you, we all give folks after meetings pl plenty of time. I've stayed in the parking lot with people <laughs> to after midnight and the cops keep driving by to make sure we go home because they get nervous that we're out there speaking. Right, council? So I, I think we, we do a good job, but I think it's just mindful of not only the, the people in the audience that have to get up and go to work the next day, but also to um, the administration and, and even us have to get up. Again, I signed up for this job. I have no problem. I could talk to two o'clock in the morning without any <laughs> issue. <laughs> but it's, I, I think we just have to, it, 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 will, it will get out of hand. So I'm not gonna support that. However, I, I do support if there's no clarity. And then when there, the room is empty like now, and if it was public comment, we have gone over and had dialogue back and forth when there's only a couple people in the audience. So, um, Again, that's how I feel about that. But I have something else for pending matters once we're wrapped up with this. Well, Council President, let me just finish up on that. Sure, so please. with pending matters, if it is a topic that we see that there is a population of people that want to continue this, the discussion, that could be just what's on our agenda, the, the pending matters. So it could, the conversation could get carried toward the end of the meeting as opposed to having that not not with dialogue. the public yeah, excuse me council uh, not with the public we'll be here to two o'clock in the morning then you're opening it up again for <laughs> trying to be fair yeah <laughs> i'd be fine with that i agree it probably would add time I, 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 my proposal is not to give anybody more time than we're already giving them right they can decide whether they want to talk for five minutes or whether they want to talk for two minutes and then it, it, in dialogue for three minutes or I think we should just take a vote or we'll be here until 11 o'clock. Oh, I don't think, yeah. Nothing but we don't have to take a vote. We don't I, have to I vote. I would this yield is... to the council president to see what kind of format she was. How she quickly was they out. forget. <laughs> council president, can I be chime taken in? out with the trash. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Are sorry, they, Mr. Casey. Right. Can I chime in here? Um, you know, you really don't have to change the rule. Um, you, you guys always have the flexibility of a motion yeah. to suspend the rule to Mm -hmm. and you can enter into a dialogue in special circumstances yeah. if there, you know it's not it doesn't have to be written in black and white um, the council president can use his or her discretion open it up to the council for you know are they willing to do this take a vote on it quickly and then okay. you can do that I mean it's not it, and, and I think that it, the general rule is probably best to follow what you've been doing but on occasion there may be justification for a special circumstance so but you have that flexibility fair enough right mm -hmm. well, yeah. that's what I'm saying I think we have been fair and respectful mm -hmm. the, the the other thing that I wanted to do is to try to be consistent to have a process and policy without getting you know huge structure or something but to consistently uh, deal with this issue for everybody so I'm worried that if somebody comes up and they're obviously going to lambaste this or whatever, or they have before and they probably want to again, I don't want to uh, 
de deprive them of their ability to speak just because we're pretty sure we're not going to like what they say. And I, I just, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Absolutely and, not. And, and That's and not why I But I, but I, I wait, 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 just one at a time, one at a time. So I, I thought that, that in the seven years that I've been here that that's occasionally happened, very rarely, but I, I felt like there were people who wanted to say something, but we didn't let them because we didn't want them to be speaking, whereas in other situations, we do allow people to speak. So I just wanted, the other thing is I just wanted to be consistent, and I'm not accusing anybody or anything, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying if we do that on a case-by-case -case basis, we run the risk of exactly. somebody saying, hey, I want to have a dialogue with you, and, and that's why we're saying we don't want to have a dialogue with you, but I'm sorry, Councilwoman. And again, I get frustrated with this because we, I feel we give a lot of time to the public. And yes, there, there are situations because there's people that could go longer than five minutes. But at any given time, I've never seen any one of us not speak to that person afterwards or uh, the next day for an hour. I mean, there's so many times I'll have a conversation and then the next day I'm talking to that person for another hour. So mm -hmm. um, I just think f for fairness in the audience, for fairness to the, the, the staff, um, it, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. I mean, <laughs> if, it's a, if it's a light meeting and we need, we've done that though. I just, yeah. it's yeah. when it's really crowded and yes, there will be meetings where people get upset and you have a large room and all the more reason why you need to be fair and give everybody the same amount of time or, or you'll just, be cra you'll be crazy. Uh, well, I will be crazy. I think it goes to what just Ken's in, point oh, about. Well, I'm just saying I think it goes to Ken's point. It would depend on the topic. It depends on what comes before us to. Yeah. If we need, which we, which we, right. Can I also add uh, one thing? If, on if I could, before before you, can I just just respond to the very briefly because I just want to make sure it's clear. I'm not suggesting that we give any additional time to anybody. I'm just saying they can decide with their five minutes how they want to do it. If they want to just talk for two minutes and sit oh, down, great. No, if they want to talk The council president, how do you cut us off? Because we tend to have diarrhea of the mouth ourselves. So, <laughs> not to paint a picture, but you know, let's speak the way we're going to speak. So, you know, so how do, so you have someone up there and they're saying, well, you used up all my three minutes babbling on, and then who's going to be the person to <laughs> have the dialogue? So, <laughs> I, need to tell you. I, I just think you're opening up the door. I think if we have a situation, again, and you've done it before where we've given more time to a certain person, like there's been, folks that come down here that never been here before or never had the unique experience of speaking at the podium and they're a little timid and we I think we've give them extra courtesy time or try to help them along and trying to converse with us but I just I just think five minutes and your five minutes goes like when you're having a conversation back and forth it's going to go fast and then they're going to feel cut off and I, I it's really going to be hard to police so i i, I won't support I'd, that. I'd be glad to run the clock but anyway mr case i, I just want to all of you have spoken about tomorrow night's planning board meeting that you intend to go um mm -hmm. obviously susan is on the board mm -hmm. she's a different situation but i assume that all of you realize that because of the open public meetings act you're going to listen Absolutely. not speak right. um other than susan so Mm -hmm. Right. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, b before we get past so that, Michelle is anything? there any? Is there? I just want to make sure we don't have to take a vote. But is there any uh, uh, anybody else who wants to try to try this for a couple of meetings? No. So I, I'm hearing four no's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Four and no's. so, four no's. Four no's. Four no's. Let's go to four Councilman, did you have something else? To <laughs> yeah, okay. this is going to be real quick. This is for Mr. Gross and Mr. And, and Mr. Sayers. If you could just pass this to them. So last year, I know our budget's coming up and it's not going to be this? for a while, so I want to give to you ahead of time. This, this was our capital summary from last year. Okay. So I just, I just wondering if my colleagues, I, I just, I, I, I know, um, I know we get information from the directors at our budget hearing. So I'm just passing along, this is the list that you gave us last year. I'm just wondering this year when we get our budget this year, if we can know what got completed on the, on the list. So we have a picture of what did get completed. And then so we know we can compare it to the list of what has to get done. So if it didn't get completed, if it gets bumped to the following year, because I, I realize things happen, things, projects don't always get completed, but I just wanted to know what got done and what 
didn't get done. I do expect in the next meeting to have a uh, resolution for uh, professional services for the firehouse. Good. Oh, good. Good. And, and again, you know, uh, we've been talking. Uh, oh. Yeah, especially a little detail, like in, in interior and exterior repairs and renovations to five firehouses, you know, did we get yeah, well, bathrooms, we'll, roofs, or yeah, a little more detail. That, that, scope, that, that scope will be in the award. So award. Okay. Yeah. Right, I spoke to Mr. Lepore about that. Okay. He said that was part of your scope document. Okay. So, <clears throat> thank, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Short. And I, I'm sure <laughs> Mr. Sears will always remember this. The last council meeting where Joe Krakowicz, the president, wouldn't let the meeting end. I just want to ask a quick question while I've got while I've got Mr. S uh, Mr. Gross here. Mr. Gross, just want to ask you about the uh, supplemental debt statement because we approved the 1.3 million. Our uh, we have a new supplemental debt statement. I know I've been badgering you for weeks to put up. It's already online. Okay, because I was going to say I thought maybe you put the. The, the now, previous I, I, one. I, I, okay, I good. The, good. To, to, to be less confused, I think I'm going to keep one up there, whatever's the most current. Yes, okay, good, good. So our debt's up to uh, almost $86.5 million. This is issued or authorized, not just issued. So some of this is not that we've issued, but it's right. It's a historically, I think it's a historically high number for our, for our townships. Anyway. Well, we're well below the state levels, 3.5, and so we're 1.461 ratio. But we're getting there. No, we're, <laughs> we actually, we pay off debt, so we, it fluctuates up and down. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask Mr. Sayers to make a motion to recess our meeting. I'm just kidding. I know you want to go. But we need to, we need to make a motion to recess the meeting and we'll reconvene on January 9th. We convene this meeting and we do it for paperwork purposes because there are certain things that we have to do in January that we can't do now having to do with the 2017 budget. Is that succinct? That's and then we will also have a regular meeting that will have hopefully very few resolutions of very few ordinances. I make and the meeting will go much faster <laughs> because I won't be sitting I make, here. I make a motion we recess until January. What was that? I make a motion we recess until Second. January. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank Very you, West Orange. We'll see you again uh, January 9th, 2018. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy, holidays. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa.